My name is Jeff Keithley. I'm uh, honored to be your chair today. I'm also chair of the Sunshine Coast Senior Citizens, and I'm an organizer with the Alliance for Democracy, which are two of the three groups uh, organized today. The third one uh, is the Sunshine Coast Conservation Association, which does such wonderful work up here on the coast. Also, on behalf of... Um, On behalf of all three organizations, I would like to say welcome to this wonderful space. I also want to uh, thank and recognize the Seashelt Nation for, one, having built the space to make this such a wonderful community space, and to uh, thank uh, both Gary Festchuk. Uh, Gary, where are you? Gary's right there, and Laurie Dixon over here, school trustee, uh, District 46 chair, um, uh, counselor. There's a lot of people involved in organizing today, and I don't intend to go over them all, but I do, and you could put your hand up when it happens. Uh, I do want to make special note of a couple of people because they've done extraordinary work. Rick Bills, right here. <laughs> Lynn Chapman, where's Lynn? Gail Riddell, who's, um, who's our timer here today, and let me warn you, she's a hard taskmaster, so when she tells you your time is up, uh, she means it. I also want to uh, thank uh, Naomi Festchuk, who's done wonderful work. Naomi, where are you? Naomi's at the back there, and, and Jason Hers, who wasn't able to be here today, but he's also been a uh, key part of the organizing. Before we go any further, I would ask that you stand for a moment of silence to show our respect and compassion for the people of the Philippines, who were so savagely uh, beaten down by Super Typhoon Haiyan. So if you would stand, please. For the 5,000 people who perished, for the 1,600 people still missing, for the bereaved ones, for the 4 million people who've been displaced, and for the almost impossible reconstruction work that must follow, join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. The format of today's follow, or format of today's forum is for about the first hour, we're going to hear from a number of speakers, and Rick Bills will introduce them in, their, in, their, in turn. We're here to talk about the transport of U.S. thermal coal from the Wyoming Basin, uh, Powder River Basin, to uh, Surrey Fraser Docks, and from there to uh, Seashelt, uh, to uh, Texada Island. You'll hear about the, the opposition that's building to those shipments and why we can and should oppose them. For the second hour or so, and we're, we're somewhat flexible with time, uh, we're going to be joined by our, our panel uh, people who will be int again introduced by Rick. And that's going to be an opportunity for you to answer, ask questions, uh, to, have, to extend your opinion. The only thing I ask of both all of the presenters and anybody uh, uh, posing a question or giving some thoughts is that we keep it as short as possible, say a couple of minutes so that as many people as possible can have, have their way into it. Round about 3.50, we're going to try and wind up the uh, program, uh, and that will involve um, uh, basically uh, looking at where do we go from here and how do we get there. Some really nuts and bolts stuff. Um, male washrooms on my right, female on my left. Uh, we have coffee, tea, and some snacks. We will not be taking a break, so please do help yourself during the course of the meeting. Uh, we're going to have, there's collection buckets on, at the door and they'll be passed around during the course of the meeting. And we'd ask you to be as generous as possible. Today cost us about $1,000 and the only thing we have to dig into is our own pockets. We get no funny from elsewhere, so we are, uh, depend on your generosity. I want to draw your attention when we look at this issue. Um, Metallurgical coal is quite different than thermal coal. Metallurgical or met coal is critical to the making of steel. It's a hard, high value, high energy, low dust commodity. And there is no other economical uh, um, substitute in steel making. Thermal coal, on the other hand, is low value, low energy, dirty, dusty, and there are lots of alternatives for electricity uh, rather than burning thermal coal. So we're going to look at the, uh, the whole issue of uh, 
where, what happens during the transport between uh, the basin and here, and uh, what those impacts are likely to be. There's also a very fundamental reason why we need to be here, and that is the issue of Canadian democracy or the loss of Canadian democracy. Increasingly, we're losing control over our lands and resources that are being ripped from our hands and turned over to foreign corporations, both at the provincial and federal le level. It's the driving force of capitalism, we're told, and it's nothing personal, it's just business. But we're also increasingly aware of the fact, and Super Typhoon High End really drove the home point home, that increasingly it's driving our, our uh, earth and our economy into the ground because the construction co reconstruction costs are going to be extraordinary. I want to read you a comment. There, at, in Warsaw, there was just concluded yesterday a two-week um, climate change uh, conference put on by the United Nations in Warsaw, Poland. And the Philippine government's chief uh, negotiator, Nadra Vieb Sanyo, made the following comment in at the outset of those talks. To anyone outside who continues to deny and ignore the reality that is climate change, I dare them. I dare them to get off their ivory towers and away from the comfort of their armchairs. I dare them to go to the islands in the Pacific, the Caribbean, the Indian Ocean, and see the impacts of rising sea levels to the mountainous regions of the Himalayas and the Andes, to see communities confronting glacial floods, to the Arctic, where communities grapple with the fast dwindling sea ice sheets, the large delta of the Mekong, the Ganges, the Amazon, the Nile, where lives and livelihoods are drowned, to the hills of Central America that confront similar monstrous hurricanes, to the vast savannas of Africa, where climate change has likewise become a matter of life and death as food and water become scarce. Not to forget the monstrous storms in the Gulf of Mexico and the eastern seaboard of North America, as well as the fires that have raged down under. And if that is not enough, they may want to see what has happened in, in the Philippines right now. And with those comments, he announced that he was starting a voluntary fast to try and draw the climate change talks to, uh, to some reasonable conclusion. Uh, they wrapped up yesterday and it was an utter failure. And to the effect that many, hundreds and hundreds of non-governmental and governmental uh, people walked out of the talks, some 133 of the 198 countries represented walked out in disgust over the lack of uh, progress. And these were the first talks that uh, had been uh, hit by or supported by the corporate sector. My timer is telling me to speed up, so I'm going to do that. One of the issues that we're running into is that the federal government has dramatically uh, cut and reduced any and all uh, serious uh, environmental regulation and, and monitoring. And so it falls to citizen actions uh, to actually begin to take that place. Uh, if, thankfully, Metro Vancouver governments have taken a strong position. Thankfully, on Wednesday, I believe, the Sunshine Coast Regional District joined in with them in that, uh, that uh, action. But more must be done, and clearly, it's going to be citizens who do that because we, in the absence of formal government uh, processes and uh, procedures, we need to take that action. So let's get started. And so with that, I want to do, introduce my good friend, Rick Bills, who I noted earlier. Uh, Rick joined our steering committee, uh, the Alliance for Democracy, uh, this, uh, um, this summer after attending a number of the rallies. He moved to Half Moon Bay in 2010 from Fairbanks, Alaska, where he's an attorney for the state of Alaska. First as a public defender for six years, and then as a legal advocate for children in the state's custody for eight years. He is very proud to be a former employee of Sarah Palin. <laughs> he has a law degree from the University of Oregon, a bachelor's degree in geography from the University of California. Rick and his partner came to Canada hoping to experience a more progressive and more compassionate society. And what did they find? Stephen Harper, Christy Clark, and Rob Ford. 
So what can I say but offer my profound apologies and a commitment to try and do better next time. Rick Bills. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Our first speaker is going to be Owen Moriarty. Owen is uh, going to just give an overview of the coal issue, the transportation issue, along with a video presentation. Owen is an independent filmmaker and investigative journalist who lives and works in the Vancouver area. He got his start filming wilderness trips to some of the most remote places in the world, including a solar powered trek across the Sanskar region of India. Since April of this year, he has been chasing coal trains, recording community events, creating media content and researching the relationship between Pet Port Metro Vancouver and the coal industry. He posts videos, articles, and anything else related to coal in the port on his website, nomorecoalexports.com. On Monday, Owen launched Real, realporthearings.org, a website where people can learn about the inadequacies of the environmental impact assessment of the Fraser Surrey Docks proposal and submit their comments to the port. Please welcome Owen Moriarty. Thanks, Rick. Okay, so this presentation is on um, the port and how it affects our lives. Let's take the next page. Okay, so when I first started this, um, somebody said to me, he said, you know, this is a, it's a really great story. There's lots of villains. It's, uh, it's just a really, really amazing story. So you can see some of these people up here, you know, Peabody Energy, you know, the Monopoly guy, our friend Harper, SNC Lab. I'll be talking about some of these guys briefly, but these are some of the players involved. And we'll go to the next slide. So just to give you an idea, um, I thought this was relevant. So um, there's a company called uh, Peabody Energy, who's a huge, huge coal company who will be sending coal up to our project. And in uh, 2007, they formed this um, offshoot company called uh, Patriot Coal. And they unloaded all of their pension obligations on it. Um, and this was a great idea. A lot of the other uh, coal companies followed suit and miraculously, um, they went bankrupt. And so they had, uh, I was reading last night, so anyways, they have uh, 13,000 retirees and healthcare benefits on the books, three times as many uh, in five years, three times as many employees retired than current employees. And so they needed, uh, they needed bailed out. And you know the way it works in the States as far as bankruptcy protection, you just unload all of your obligations. So the other coal companies got in play and they unloaded all their obligations to the same company and it's folded. And this is, um, and at the same time, while the court was granting this, they awarded themselves $6 million in executive bonuses. So the reason why I provided this story is to give you an idea of who we're dealing with. Next slide, please. So this is um, BNSF Railroad. I made a video um, several months ago. It was actually uh, um, about a month before the big disaster happened in, uh, in Quebec. And um, this bridge um, is literally falling to pieces. Uh, chlorine gas is uh, transported across it, um, but it, uh, it got a huge amount of coverage, especially after the disaster. And um, the BNSF Railroad just has refused to, they're, they, they're just delaying fixing it. Um, this is through White Rock, um, if, and this is uh, chlorine gas from uh, North Vancouver shipped across this rail line. If they had a derailment there, it would kill thousands of people. So this is yet another example of um, who we're dealing with. So let's get Frank. So um, this is SNC-Lavalin, um, the huge multinational from Quebec. Um, they, uh, about two days, actually the day after, um, Fraser Surrey Docks announced they were uh, completing the EIA and, and it was gonna be done by their friends SNC-Lavalin, this article came out in the Financial Post saying that uh, Canada now dominates the World Bank corruption list thanks to SNC-Lavalin. Well, 115 of the 117 banned U.S. companies are SNC Lavalin or Associates or its affiliates. So, just gives an idea. And they expected the the um, EIA would take two weeks to complete. So you can see where this where this story is going. Uh, and across across all the bottoms of the slides, you'll see realporthearings.org, which is the website I created on Monday, which I'll get into later. The next slide, please. So, to um, you know, against all this, this is Port Metro's beautiful statement, their vision statement, to lead the growth of Canada's Pacific Gateway in a, matter that, in a manner that enhances the well-being of Canadians. Now, they always talk about this in really glowing rhetoric, but it's something that, um, it just, it's just fluff, nothing but fluff. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, maybe, I think uh, some of the people will touch on this later on. So, Port Metro's board, who's totally unaccountable, is made up of 11 members, 
eight of which um, are on recommendations of the port users group, which is the people who own the ports. So they're unelected, unanswerable, and they have an enormous conflict of interest, but it's amazing because they don't seem to think they do. Um, and last question there was like, what century does that remind us of? I mean, at least 100 years ago. So one of the, um, I mean, Frank and I have been all over the place and so many other people are involved in this issue, but one of the things that keeps coming up is people talk about, well, the jobs, the jobs, the jobs. Well, um, when I was up on uh, Texas Island Island the last time, uh, Guy Gender, who used to be my MLA from Delta, which is where I live, he stood up and talked about um, the fact that Poor Metro Vancouver hires, is uh, promoting the hiring of temporary foreign workers, and, uh, which I thought was very interesting. And so um, I, found the, uh, I found the article, and Baser found this is from their, uh, their Standing Committee on Finance from 2012, and they're a huge fan of it. They're a huge fan of opening up foreign trade zones. So this regulatory agency um, is trying to bring in foreign workers to, and they're also reducing jobs anywhere they go as it is. But I mean, you talk one way in the well, in, I'd like to go back to the last slide, but in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the best interest of Canadians, but yet you're trying to accelerate the hiring of overseas for Canadian jobs. Let's go forward again, Frank. So I don't know if anybody, uh, so this is, um, this is Alan Fryer. Uh, you'll see him, he's quoted a lot in the media, an enormous amount. Um, Alan Fryer is uh, the spokesperson for, for the Coal Alliance, but he's also, um, previous to that and still currently, he's a senior consultant, he's an employee of National PR Firm, who is, um, which is the company that Port Metro Vancouver hired um, in 2012 to basically um, try and smooth out this process. Now, uh, groups down on the lower mainland, voters taking action against climate change, have discovered um, really um, very, very cozy relationship between the port, our, you know, who's looking out for our best interests, the coal alliance, uh, national PR firm, the coal companies, the railroads, um, and this is all happening behind the scenes. So, um, and you'll see if you're, you're following, if you're seeing on the news, Alan's quoted a lot. So when you see Alan Fryer, a spokesman for the coal alliance, remember this slide, because he's quoted a lot. Next slide, please. So one of the other things, um, so what we're getting down south is, is an enormous amount of um, media, or not media coverage, but um, promotional materials, to put it lightly, um, showing from movie theaters and on TV about how great a job that Port Metro Vancouver is doing. And one of the um, cozy figures they quote is this, um, they reduced, due to uh, shoreline power emissions with cruise ships, they reduced their greenhouse gas, gas emissions by 2,200 tons. Well, they exported 81 million tons of greenhouse gases in the same year, which is roughly 40,000 times the difference. But that, um, that figure doesn't get mentioned. Next slide, please. So uh, Frank will get into maybe some of this later on, but this is an example of, um, this is a letter that Port Metro Vancouver sent to the health authorities where they tell them, and all these slides will be available afterwards, that basically, well, y you talked about having jurisdiction over this, but you don't. And uh, it really doesn't matter what you're gonna do um, you know, the, uh, listen, we also believe that it is inappropriate, uh, that it, it is appropriate for Port Metro Vancouver to ultimately establish the specific process and requirements for this aspect of the permitting process with due regard to input from relevant agencies. Basically, uh, we can all read between the lines, but this came out, how long ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago? 17th. Yeah, 17th. Um, next slide, please. So to give a little um, background on this, and I'm sure a lot of us are aware of lots of the, these details, I'd like to point out the, the common thread. So Neptune Terminals was um, their, quite quickly, their coal exporting uh, numbers went from nine to 18 million tons. And what happened was they did this kind of same process we're having now, and they encouraged the public to submit comments uh, through Port Metro Vancouver's website, and nobody ever saw what they were. What have I got about five? Two minutes, oh perfect, well, I, can go, I can go fast. So anyways, they, um, and they produce a summary document, and. Um, and basically what happened was it was discovered after the fact that they basically made up a bunch of the numbers and they said, well, they probably could have handled that better. And remember, this is the regulator. Next slide, please. So fast forward to today, uh, Phrase 3 Docs, um, they refused to hold any public uh, consultations. Um, they eventually held open houses, which then they used to say that they'd conducted um, public uh, consultation. They gave us a 30-day commenting period to comment through their website, which brings us to which is totally private, which brings us to realporthearings.org, which I started on Monday. Any comment you send to the port, next slide please, Frank. Um, 
there's a lot of information on the EIA, huge amount of stuff. There's, there's questions from Frank of what should be raised as part of a health impact assessment. There's an enormous amount of stuff. But the key to the website is you submit your comment through the site. Now it shows who it CCs, who gets it, but the site gets a record of what you sent in. And then that comment gets put with the rest on the website so we can all see it. So no matter what happens, we'll be able to show what about these 500, what about these 1,000 people that wrote in and said that? And we're not going to get tricked like last time. Next slide, please. And these are some of the pages on the site, but this is what you see. So it's very, very simple. Send in your comments. Click on that. Scroll down to the bottom. You can enter your comments. There's a, there's a counter right on the right-hand side which shows how much time we have left. And we're going to keep going past the 30 days. We're not giving up. Um, forward again, Frank, please. Forward again. Uh, this is uh, various things. What's wrong with the IA? This filled with um, articles. I've got lots of my own um, videos on there as well from various uh, uh, public forums, uh, statements by Port Metro Vancouver. There is a huge amount of information on it. Um, onwards again, please. And uh, yeah, guide to assessment best practices. Um, there's uh, yeah, it's worth looking at. And this is what the public uh, comments looked at uh, at uh, 5:40 this morning when I was still working on this. Um, and I think we're pretty much done. Let's see. We got anything after that? Oh, and oh, and one, one more thing. So there's so one of the things. One of the speakers last night who talked about how to give comments, and he's a brilliant, brilliant uh, guy named James Wells, which I'll put his stuff on my website as well. But what he talked about is talked about um, where we live. So that's my my wife and my daughter. Um, and in terms of where things appear on a map and where things really are. The talk about how things are local to you. So when you, when you write a comment in, don't say, I'm opposed to this. I mean, obviously say that if you're opposed, you are opposed. But explain why and explain personally how it affects you. And the key, he, he said, and they did tons of workshops in Washington State about this, is to have an ask. Is to have, not just say, well, this, that, I don't, I don't believe this. I don't, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work for me, I don't support this. Say what you're going to say with a specific criticism or how it affects your life and have an ask. And I think that anything else after that? And, and have, have an ask. Have an ask. Like, um, I want you to, um, to look at this aspect of things. Like, I want, uh, I am concerned about this uh, species, this type of, uh, this aspect of my life being affected by your proposal, and I want you to conduct more information about it. Uh, there's, uh, I'll be putting a bunch of more stuff on my website about it as well, but the how you ask is very, very crucial. And the last is basically, this is where we live. And, uh, oh, sorry, I'm not loud enough. The, um, but this is, this is basically, this is where we live. And uh, it's no longer going to look like this if, um, if we have no control of our own uh, democratic process, and we don't have a democratic process with the port, and um, it's time we took back the port. Thank you very much, Owen. We're very fortunate to have the next speaker, Dr. Frank James. Uh, he's been doing a lot of work on this issue. Um, he's been traveling all around Washington and uh, Texada Island, uh, Powell River, giving speech, uh, talks about the, the health impact of this coal shipment, the thermal coal dust, what, is, what it's going to do to people, what it could do to people. Dr. James is the health officer for Washington State San Juan County. He's also a professor of public health at the University of Washington. Dr. James is a member of Watcom Docs, a group of physicians that formed two years ago when it learned of a proposal to ship up to 48 million tons of Wyoming coal through Bellingham, Washington. Watcom Docs has since grown to 215 members. He has done extensive research on the health problems associated with shipping coal and has spoken about the findings across Washington, um, the Lower Mainland, Texada Island, and Powell River. He has a bachelor's degree in psychology and sociology from Western Washington University, a PhD in sociolinguistics from Boston University, and an MD from the University of Washington. Please welcome Dr. Frank James. I'm going to hurry a little bit. Um, so I'm Frank James. I'm, I'm more than happy to be here. Um, this is, I think, the 17th talk I've given in BC in the past two months. Um, and you may ask why. Uh, the reason I leave my wife and son at home and come and spend time up here in BC is because it matters. What's happening to you, they want to do to our community too. And what I can tell you is that that's something that when you really understand it, it's not okay. It's really not okay. 
the, so the reason I do that is to come and share what it took two, us two years to learn, a group of very smart, highly motivated physicians. And you're being given 30 days to respond. In fact, you, you got about 21 left. You have three weeks. And you need to get motivated. You need to get involved. You need to make comments. Uh, we need to raise money to get the best lawyers. We need to get the best technical experts to review this. Short of that, this is going to happen. That's what it's going to take. Um, the BC Nurses Union was asked and in two days turned around this comment. And they, they nailed it. They said, uh, we're extremely concerned about the latest EIA reports. And it fails to adequately address human health impacts associated with the project, which they definitely do not. The health officers uh, for this region were involved and got it to look at a copy. They gave several uh, specific feedbacks, uh, and the response to that was, thank you, we don't, want, we don't want any more information from you. That's literally how blunt the letter was from the port. Now, the port is supposed to be the regulator. The proponent is Fraser Surrey Docks. The port's supposed to regulate. They are, in fact, not regulating at all. Uh, the BC Nurses Union went on to say, it's also alarming that the, um, that the assessment focused primarily on thermal rather than on full, on the terminal rather than the full geographic area. So they, they aren't even considering what's all these trains going through White Rock and the potential implications there. I'll talk more about that in a minute. They didn't concern, aren't concerned at all about Texade Island where, where the protections in, at, in Surrey are really much more substantial. There are virtually no protections in Texade Island. They're just gonna pile the stuff up and let it blow around the wind spray a little water on it once in a while to hopefully prevent that. It's that blatant. Um, now you're along the way. There's gonna be coal going uh, literally every day along, uh, along the, the land here. And there's absolutely no consideration of that in their assessment either. So if, if anybody thinks that's an adequate environmental assessment, uh, they, they need to get a job at the port. <laughs> the, uh, as you can see, they focus almost all of their work on the Fraser Surrey docks itself. They don't want to look outside of really the perimeter of the, of the land that's there. But I want to share with you, this isn't just about us and our community. It's not about me and my community. The reason I came here is because this starts in Montana and Wyoming. And it isn't just the 8 million tons that's going coming here. There's about, because US uh, electrical generation is moving away from coal, there's about 120 million tons of coal they're not selling in the US. And what they have discovered is they can sell it in China, India, and Korea. And if they do that, they can make a lot of money. This coal comes from the US. It's owned by the US government. They sell it uh, to, to these people for about $11 a ton. Now, any of you that may have been farmers know that $11 a ton, a good topsoil costs a lot more than that. So it's an extremely low value product and they're shipping it literally halfway around the world, and they plan on making money doing it. Well, the only way they can make money doing that is cutting corners everywhere. Um, so not only is it gonna expose coal dust to all the communities along the way, in Montana, in Wyoming, in Idaho, in Washington, and in BC, it's also then gonna be shipped across the ocean all the way to China and India and, and uh, Korea. Now, what, another reason I'm here talking to you today is that my wife sitting in the front row here is obviously Chinese. Um, in the past few months, she's returned to, to her home. And the reason she returned is there are three elders there that she and, and I love very much. Her aunt had stomach cancer and had to have her stomach removed. Her uncle had laryngeal cancer and had to have a trach put in so he could breathe and a feeding tube in it put in so he could, he could consume nutrients. And my favorite uncle uh, of hers, uh, had a stroke and died. Now, what's going on in China is, um, is really horrible beyond our imagination. A square meter a, a, is one thing, and I take a cubic meter of air, and typically we have about 20 particles in that of, of, of pollutants, 20 particles. In the US and Canada, if that level gets to 100, people with pulmonary disease or kids with asthma are supposed to go inside and lay down. Typically in China and the coastal cities, the, the bottom tier, the bottom number is about 300 particles in that, in that cubic meter. And the last few years in the large urban cities, those levels have gotten up to seven to 900, occasionally even 1,000. Now honestly, that's incompatible with life, period. There was an article recently published about a girl eight years old in China with lung cancer. 
every year our life, our life expectancy grows as, as, as a world population. Things, things aren't always rosy, but every year our life expectancy grows. The only exception is when there's a war. Now, that changed this, this past 10 year cycle. They just analyzed the data for coastal China and they lost five and a half years of life expectancy on average. That's never happened before in the past 100 years since we've been engaged in that exercise. So this is about us and about our interests. Yeah, we're NIMBYs. This train goes within about three quarters of a mile of my home. But it's about the people in Montana that are mining it and ruining the ranches and farms there. It's about the, the wetlands all along the way that are having coal, dumped, coal dust dumped into them. It's about your community and my community. But it's also about people that, that are getting a much shorter end of the stick than we are. People for whom this is really killing in a very direct, immediate, and, and uh, a dare, si dare, dare I say, genocidal way. Um, so it's, it's not just about us. And I think we need to be mindful of that. And the effort we put into this has to be in it for our best interests. But our best interests serve a lot of other people very well. Um, 120 million tons of additional capacity. Now, I can even tell you where it's going. Here's the, here's the chart. Um, so uh, 120 million tons, you can see it there. Um, some out through Washington and Oregon, and then four places here in BC where they're either building the new port, as in Fraser Story Docks, or expanding existing ports in three other places. They want to only look at what's inside the fence at Fraser Story Docks. They do not want to look at the cumulative effects. But the cumulative effects are the only thing you can look at if you expect to realistically understand the impacts. So one thing I hope some Canadian citizen speaks out about clearly and articulately is that cumulative impacts have to be addressed, not just for Fraser Street Docks, but for Neptune, uh, for, for Port Metro, uh, for the Prince Rupert, uh, for Port Alberni. All of those together are very different than just one by themselves, both in terms of what it does abroad, but also what it does here. Um, now, when we first started this, the group of physicians and I, there were about a dozen of us. And one young woman physician whom all of us respect, and the reason we respect her is that she's in, she has both an MD degree from Harvard and a PhD uh, in epidemiology from the University of Washington. She's very smart, and she's an infectious disease expert. And if any of our children were sick, if my son was ill and in the hospital and might die, she's the person I would want to take care of him. So when she asked us, this is important. Do you want to take a look at it with me? We all said yes. You know, that dozen, about a half those people had PhDs in addition to having MD degrees. And so we did what academics do. We went straight to the library. And we asked B, the librarian, to, to find us all the articles on the storage and transportation of coal. And she came up with about 400 articles. And we worked through those one at a time. Now, we're very busy people. And we did, actually didn't have time to, uh, to do a lot of this during the day. So almost everything we did, between, we did between 9 in, at night and about 2 in the morning. And then we'd review the article, and then we'd share it with each other, and we'd critically assess them. Now, one of the guys said, you know, he, he said, this guy, he was, he's actually a pretty smart guy. He was an ER doc and then became a dermatologist. Uh, and he said, noise is really a big deal, Frank. He came to me just excited about it, and I said, Dr. Dank, you're nuts. You know, if we start talking about noise, nobody is going to believe us. You know, that just doesn't have any credibility. But the standard we had in our work was, what does the science say? We only looked at articles published in refereed journals. That means that people had critically evaluated them before they were ever published. This isn't stuff out of the New York Times. Um, this is stuff out of the New England Journal of Medicine, which is arguably the most prestigious journal in, in the world. And it, these are articles that have been critically evaluated before they were ever published. So only journals that were uh, publishing refereed articles, that is, they've been critically assessed before published. And as we went through these, uh, these 400 articles, we expected them to kind of be evenly distributed between things that said it was OK and things that said it wasn't. And, and what we found was all 400 went into something to be concerned about. Um, and so we looked at article after article, after article, after article, and these are summaries of each of those. We wrote an abstract of every one, and 
anybody i would love for somebody from the industry to take us on because we not only we do believe in transparency we put every one of these references and our summary up on a website and invite anybody to look at it and i, I honestly wish they would convince me that we're wrong um, because then i could quit doing this stuff <laughs> um, but we, no one's done that yet so unlike the port and hiding everything we put it all up on a website coltrainfacts.org and anybody can go look at it, and I would encourage them to do that and to prove that what our conclusions are erroneous. Um, we, um, we then piled them up into piles and said, here's the general areas. Well, the general areas are that the coal dust is a problem, the diesel uh, exhaust from the, the locomotives is a problem. There are about six locomotives are required to pull every one of these trains, and the trains are about two kilometers long. We live near enough the tracks we can hear trains, and we, we used to find them very charming when they go back and forth. Um, but the coal trains, you can hear f for two or three miles away because they're so heavy and so noisy, and, and the metal on metal wheel on the rail squeals and screeches so much that you, uh, you hear it a long ways off. Um, six locomotives required to pull them, they're so heavy. Um, so that creates diesel exhaust in a way that other, other train traffic doesn't. The noise issue turned out to be a very substantial one, and I'll go over that in detail. We also found there would be delays in the crossings. Um, uh, that is, that fire and police and ambulances will not be able to cross the tracks like they used to for us. Um, that there were also safety issues about both trains and ships. Uh, the trains, if they lock up all the brakes, something they, 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 they gotta stop, but it takes a mile for them to stop. That's how far it is before, if they lock up all the brakes, a mile. So if there's somebody on the tracks, uh, as happened in our community a few years ago and has happened in White Rock just a few, few months ago, there was a woman there who had some earbuds in. I'm sure they locked up all the, all the tire, all the wheels, and she was run over and killed. The same exact thing that happened in our community. We'll see more of that. Uh, ships, the same thing, and ships are something you really should be concerned about and not pe people don't say enough about. These ships that they plan on bringing in here, the reason they're not loading them up is they can't get up the Fraser, so they're taking them to Taxata. These are the largest things that human beings have ever made that move. That's how big they are. And they have uh, a single hull, and coal is pretty inert compared to the hundreds of thousands of gallons of diesel that they're required to carry to get across the ocean. Now, you already know, if you've been reading the press at all, that BC is not prepared to respond to a major oil spill in the Salish Sea. Um, and these, these vessels have the worst safety record of any vessel. Single hold, hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel. So, the primary organ systems we've seen that, that were infected are basically respiratory, cardiovascular, and neurologic systems. Um, there were two other things we found that were really important. One is that, is that where you live matters, and, and how close you are to the tracks matters. And the thing that they do not want to talk about is that that risk is not evenly spread in the population. What, what is very clear from scientific literature is if you live uh, where the wind blows this stuff towards you, whether it's the diesel particulate or the coal ash, I mean coal, coal dust, it's a big deal which side of the tracks you live on given the prevailing wind. One group is not gonna be exposed very much at all. The other group is gonna be heavily exposed. It also matters how close you are. The, the recent study in, down in Delta showed that if you're five kilometers or so away, there's not much exposure. And that ended up in the press because the, these guys are really good at it as there's no problem. If you look at the one sample that was done near the tracks, it was 30 times the allowable level of coal dust in, in the air, 30 times higher. And they didn't test anything in between. <laughs> but it's a gradient, high exposure close to it, much less further away. What the proponents want to do with, in our community is they wanted to average the whole county, trying to take the pollution by the track. Now, if you know anything about Whatcom County, it goes halfway across Washington State and two-thirds of it is, is wilderness area. They would love to average it over the whole county. You get a really different number. But so it is, risk is not evenly spread in the community and that's got to be something taken into account in the analysis of this. Um, the other thing is that risk is not also evenly spread in the community. And what we found over and over again in the medical literature is that children are at higher risk, elders are at higher risk, 
people with existing lung and heart conditions are at higher risk. Uh, those people that have diabetes are at higher risk, and, and workers are probably the most exposed of anybody. It's really problematic for me to see them get all their employees you know, supporting this because they're at, at higher risk than any of us. But because of where they get their paycheck, they, their views are modified. Um, children in particular, you may say, well, why kids? Kids, they eat more, they, they breathe more, they drink more per body weight than adults do. So they're more highly exposed to all these things we're talking about. Um, coal dust, in terms of now talking about specific exposures, is known to cause chronic bronchitis, emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis, and it's filled with contaminants of different heavy metals. Um, the uh, diesel particulate matter, the stuff that comes out of the locomotives and the ships and the, bar the ships that move the barges, um, increased all-cause mortalities associated with the increased number of that, impaired pulmonary development in adolescence, measurable pulmonary inflammation, increased severity and frequency of asthma attacks, ER visits and hospital admissions for kids, increased rates of heart attacks in adults, and increased rates of cancer. Um, diesel particulates do deserve just a minute of focus. They are 2.5 microns in size. There's a carbon core. And once that diesel is burnt, then things stick to that, the organic compounds, the sulfates and nitrates, the metals and the toxins. But because it's 2.5 microns in size, it's breathed into your lung and goes down all the way to your capillaries. So it goes to the alveoli and then crosses the alveolar wall into your capillaries. So you're, you're basically mainlining those things. If I want to get a, a medicine into a patient, it's more effective to give them a puffer than it is to shoot at IV because the, the surface area of your lungs is the same as a doubles tennis court. So you get higher levels quicker by breathing it in than you would by administering it intravenously. And unfortunately, that's great with drugs that you need, not so great if they're toxins. Noise exposure has been shown to cause cardiovascular disease, including increased blood pressure and arrhythmias, particularly in elders. Strokes and ischemic heart disease go up. Cognitive impairment in children for those that live near the tracks. An increased rate of accidents and injuries for people that, that are working people that are woken up at night and exacerbation of a variety of mental health conditions. You can see that um, the one place you wouldn't want to put this is near a school and every one of those gray buildings is a school. Frequent long trains are, are a big deal for some people, mostly down just after it crosses the border. We work desperately hard to shave 45 seconds off a response time. If we can shave 45 seconds off, we prevent strokes from having an impact and we, we fix heart attacks. They're talking about eight to 10 minute minimum, minimum delay in response. That's not just the ambulance, that's the police, that's the fire. Eight to 10 minutes is a long time if, you're fire, if your house is burning or if there's somebody with a gun. <laughs> um, what we believe is necessary is a health impact assessment. That is an objective, independent, fair, fair to them, fair to the public evaluation to take this information we've generated and to apply it to the specific population that's gonna be exposed and to generate the numbers about how many people could be injured or suffered or killed from this. They will do anything not to do that. They've done their, I, I, I know what's happened in my community, they've done their uh, uh, focus groups in the community and they know that if it is jobs versus uh, the environment, jobs will always win. If the discussion though is the health of my wife, my child, my grandchild, my parents, their health and their life versus any amount of money that's profit for them, then the community would win and they would not. So. One of the things I believe we have to ask for is an, is an objective and fair and impartial application of the information we've found to the populations that will be exposed. And I think it's imperative that they do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was eye-opening. As you can tell, this had a lot of impacts here going on, um, on land and in the water. And our next, well, before I go there, um, one thing I wanted to remind you, there's a lot of websites being listed out, and there was flyers that you might have picked up when you first came in. On the back side of them has all the websites listed and a bunch of other ones um, for you to do research on, get more informed about, um, start educating yourself and others about. 
And um, one person I'd like to thank that Jeff had forgotten is George Smith here. He did a lot of work at the beginning. He's been gone for a while, but he um, went to Texada Island at the public hearing that Lafarge had and connected with Owen and some of the other people pointed questions, uh, put questions towards them about climate change that they weren't ready to really address and really put the pressure on them from the beginning. Because that's the only, the only public forum that's really been um, presented at this point. It was a small one in Texada Island that wasn't well um, uh, publicized and really wasn't well attended, but he took the time to go out there to get information and start recruiting um, to, to build what we have here today. So I wanted to thank George. So one of the, one of the obvious uh, points that people should have concern about is what is it going to do to the marine environment? And we have Andre Sabaleski here to, to address some of the concerns. Um, Andre lives in Roberts Creek and has uh, 24 years of professional experience in dealing with pollutants from mines, forestry, and forestry operations. His primary focus has been to assess hazards from mines in Western Canada and the USA and to treat their contaminated discharges. Throughout his career, Andre has worked for industry, government, NGOs, and First Nations. He currently runs and operates his company, Clear Coast Consulting in Roberts Creek. Please welcome Andre. I actually live in Gibson, it's not in Rabbit's Creek. Oh, Just fixing it. Um, thanks for having me here. I'm realizing all of us here on the panel live in fear of this dinger that is going <laughs> to tell us our throats are going to be slashed if we go on too far. So I'll, I'll try to be as brief and direct as I can. Um, Rick mentioned that professionally, I have worked for 24 years. In that time, I've conducted perhaps a dozen uh, impact assessments. When I say conducted, I mean that I've been part of a team with many different people over the course of anywhere between three months and as, mu as long as a year or more in conducting an impact assessment. By comparison, the process that I understand has taken place is absolutely woefully inadequate. And the, the report that was written on the environmental impact aspect of this project is among the least competent documents that I've ever seen written on that particular subject for a particular project. This is what's being proposed. You've seen this slide before. My focus is strictly on the environmental impacts of this project and on the environmental impacts that have been neglected in the Triton report and that are most pertinent to us here living on the coast. That is, what happens as the barges carry the coal from uh, the main, lower mainland to Texada Island. These barges, I presume, I haven't seen them, I haven't seen any barges carrying coal, but I presume that the same as the barges that carry wood chips that we see going up and down the coast, so they're one to several uh, large barges that are topped uh, with, I presume that will be coal, and in essence, they're much the same as some of the trains that uh, Dr. Frank has talked about, uh, uh, sorry, that, that Frank has shown on, on the presentation, which means that they'll be releasing coal dust along the shipping lanes here. And I think the primary focus on any kind of environmental impact as it affects us on the coast is what will happen to coal dust that's released along those shipping lanes, uh, shipping lanes here. The first thing I did is just straight up look up current charts and see where the currents flow uh, along the route. And what you can see is that any coal dust that's released along the route some of it would come along the peninsula on our side, 
Some of it would come along Lascuri Island. Some of it can flow on, uh, on Vancouver Island. We're not sure where we'd end up. We're not sure how much we'd end up. That's something that ought to be investigated. I can show you the map going the other way. So any coal dust coming off Texeda Island, where would it go? It would hit Lasquiti Island on the other side. It would hit the uh, uh, Denman and Hornby and up on the shore on Vancouver Island. If you look at slack tide, uh, water goes pretty much anywhere in this area. So in effect, the area that would be impacted by coal dust potentially is anywhere around uh, Texeda Island, including the Seashell Peninsula on the, on the east side, Vancouver Island on the west side, and all of the islands in between. I think that's important because they represent different marine environments, marine habitats for different species that could have impacts and eventually could, could impact us as well. What sort of potential impacts could occur? I'm only talking here about environmental impacts and I'm ignoring climate change even though it's a significant environmental impact. For the purpose of this talk here, all I'm talking about is what could possibly happen on the coast. So the coal dust that's released by these barges, and it's likely to be very substantial, would be deposited in those areas, in those communities, uh, following the currents from where the dust is released to where it eventually ends up. The coal dust, the coal dust largely floats on water. Eventually, some of it sinks in. So a fair bit of that dust would be deposited on shorelines. Some of it could sink in. Some, uh, some of the, when it's deposited on the shoreline, it depends on the tide. So it'll be anywhere in that between high tide and the low tide mark. Some of it will be deposited below that, uh, uh, even below the low tide mark. So for example, some of it could be deposited on kelp, where herring spawn. And one of, the, one of the properties of the coal dust is that it sticks to uh, wherever, wherever it is deposited, it sticks there. So if some of it is deposited on kelp, it's likely that the kelp will start accumulating that coal dust for as long as it remains in place. Um, now, I don't know how long live some of those kelp strands could be, but I can tell you that the proposed project is for years and years and years of shipping that material, meaning years and years and years of deposition of that coal dust, meaning that it'll accumulate over time over all those places where the coal dust is deposited. How much will be deposited during those years is something that ought to be looked at, but that has not been looked at. Will it have an impact on us that has to be looked at, but has not been looked at? In terms of impacts on organisms, I think primarily what we have to look at are shellfish and other filter feeding organisms. Because the, these filter feeders, basically they're set up to grab whatever small particles there are in the water column and bring them in and then digest away any of the organic material that's there. Well, coal dust is exactly the kind of stuff that they would be filtering away. So what we're talking about are mussels, oysters, any of the other shellfish. If you go back there, Fanny Bay is just around there. That's a well-known place where there are shellfish that are grown. What other places are there the, uh, with oyster leases that might potentially be impacted? And then we have to ask the question, what's in coal dust that could potentially have an impact there? The other potential impact would be fish that are grown in open nets. I don't think that'll be as significant as it could be on, on shellfish, uh, but still I pointed out there, that's something that should be looked at. And then another impact that I've inferred is for example, the herring spawning on the kelp potentially could be impacted. Some other wildlife, uh, marine organisms that ingest contaminants that are transferred through the food chain. 
again, that's something that needs to be looked at and quantified has been ignored. Oh, I'm watching that time in the dinger here. I'm worried. All right. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole chemistry of coal, but I want to highlight one thing is that coal contains mercury. And mercury happens to enter the food chain and stay in the food chain more than just about any of the other toxicants that are present in coal does. So mercury is really what we have to worry about. And if you're trying to sell oysters that have got mercury in the tissues, you've know, you got a problem on your hands. Um, when I compare, incidentally, I, I, was, I was stunned when I saw this. Table two down below is a table pulled out of the Triton report, and it, talk, and it describes, it provides data on the metal concentrations in coal uh, that they use for, for the assessment. When I looked at original sources, the table that I have comes from the U.S. Geological Survey and is an average of something like 4,000 or 10,000 uh, samples of coal. And the numbers that I get for Powder River coal are actually quite different from the numbers that Triton uses in their assessment. So they don't even get the right numbers in doing their assessment. Um, the methodology was also flawed. Uh, the methodology said, for example, on the table for mercury, since the number of, since the concentrations of mercury are lower than the, the, the levels that are allowable for the sediment quality guidelines, we don't expect to be any effects of mercury, for example, uh, based on that particular criterion. The flaw in that argument, number one, is that the number that they work with is incorrect, and number two, there's a bioaccumulation and biomagnification of the metal concentrations, meaning you start with one, it builds to three, it builds to 10, it builds to 20, it magnifies over time. And because we're talking about long-term processes, that biomagnification will occur over time. So that the starting number that you have over a period of time now builds up to a level that exceeds whatever guidelines you have there. The reasoning is flawed in this particular process and, or in this particular analysis, and I'm only providing you one example of a number that could be criticized in that particular way. So the point that I'm making here is that the environmental impact assessment that was done does not look at our own communities, does not look correctly at potential impacts, and these impacts are something we have to worry about because they may affect us on the coast. Now, I don't have any, uh, how should I say it, thorough analysis of potential impacts because that's something that takes a lot more than the few uh, days and weeks that I've had to prepare for this. In fact, to do a proper analysis you have to look at these things, you have to do modeling and simulations that will take months uh, to carry out. The, the, the review that has been done has been done in a matter of a few weeks. It's absolutely inadequate. And the proper way to arrive at the answers to some of those questions is to do a, a thorough, proper uh, an, a assessment of a potential, environment, in, potential environmental impacts. Sorry. Um, and that brings me back to the very first slide that I had, which said, we are now getting scored as having some of the worst environmental protection ranking in the world. Why is that? This here is an example of why that is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. And just as a reminder, the speakers here are doing this out of their own free will. Andre did a presentation here. We called them up. George actually got us in touch with him, and he did this whole analysis on his own. He's not getting paid. He's doing it to try to educate the community about the, the dangers out there. So really give these people a, a, a round of applause for going, coming and doing this. Our next speaker is Katherine Harrison, and likewise, she's coming over from Vancouver to speak today. 
Um, there's a slight uh, an inaccurate description of her title in the program. She's not a climate change scientist. Um, her background is actually just amazingly impressive, and I'll get to it in a second. She's going to discuss climate change um, and the impact of burning all this coal, and where's the coal going to go, what's going to happen to it, they're going to burn it, and she's going to describe a little bit about the climate change impact that Andre had mentioned. She's also going to address the coal issue, how um, the coal issue demonstrates the deterioration of the democratic process that um, why are we here? Why can't anyone you know, explain themselves or get a voice in this? Why aren't their impact statements automatically being done? Why do we have to you know, fight and scream for this? Um, and as you can tell from her background, it's amazing that she can address both of these issues. Catherine is a professor of political science at the University of British Columbia. She has a bachelor's degree in engineering from the University of Western Ontario. She has master's degrees in political science and chemical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a PhD in political science from the University of British Columbia. Before entering academia, she worked as a chemical engineer in the oil industry and as a policy analyst for both Environmental Canada and the United States Congress. Dr. Harrison is the author or editor of several volumes, the most recent of which is Global Commons, Domestic Decisions, The Comparative Politics of Climate Change, and is published widely on climate and environmental policy. Frustrated by policymakers' rejection of both expert and voters' advice, she has become increasingly active in two volunteer NGOs, UBCC 350 and Voters Taking Action on Climate Change. Please welcome Katherine Harrison. educated technical assistance here. If I fall off the stage, he'll take care of me too. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and to see so many people in the room um, this afternoon. I wanted to add another dimension to this uh, issue in addition to the um, potentially very uh, severe risks to human health and the local environment, and that is uh, the threat of contributing significantly to global climate change. And um, it's really timely uh, to talk about climate change with the failure yesterday of the um, Warsaw International Climate Negotiations round, um, and also with the release this fall of the fifth assessment report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That's a, um, an international process that involves many thousands of scientists from around the world in extensive review. and. Contrary to what one, one might read, including on the commentary pages of the Vancouver Sun, there is extremely strong consensus among the scientific community that uh, climate change is happening and that it, uh, human activity is at least a very significant contribution to that. Um, the fifth assessment report, which was released in late September, projected that if we don't change, if we continue on a business as usual trajectory, by the end of this century, the global climate will increase on average by four degrees Celsius. Now, that doesn't sound like very much. You know, the temperature in this room has probably fluctuated by that much since we came in. But the difference between the temperature today and the last ice age is just a little more than four degrees Celsius. So when we talk about the global climate change, uh, climate, that is a massive increase. The increase is likely to be, um, is projected to be much greater in the northern hemisphere, and in particular, the projections show that um, if we reach a four degrees Celsius increase on average across the planet, that will be eight degrees Celsius in Canada. Um, that will have significant impacts on our ecosystems. Imagine changing when the peak river flows are by 30 to 60 days in the Fraser River and what that would do um, to species that don't adapt that quickly. Um, but what's particularly troubling for me are the projections of how, um, how severe the impacts will be on um, the global south, uh, the, the developing world that has contributed the least to this problem. Um, it is projected that sea level rise will be greater uh, near the equator. Um, storm surges will be greater. It just happens that there are hundreds of millions of people living in low-lying cities, um, places like Bangladesh, um, low-lying Pacific Islands that will be devastated. Uh, hundreds of millions of people displaced by that sea level increase. The temperature increase, although not as great as we will see in Canada, will kill more people um, in places where it, it's already difficult to survive very hot temperatures. 
um, so you know, sub-Saharan Africa. Those are also the places that will be hit hardest by drought, where they're already not producing enough food in many cases to provide nutrition for the people who live there. And people in poor countries are more vulnerable to climate change by virtue of living in um, uh, less, uh, less secure dwellings, um, not having air conditioning and so on to protect them from heat waves. The, the photo here is the Philippine uh, lead climate uh, change negotiator who uh, was on uh, a hunger strike throughout the, the negotiations that just concluded. As early as 2000, a scientific study uh, estimated that there are 150,000 deaths per year already as a result of climate change. And what, um, that will obviously get much, much greater as we increase the, the climate from a 0.65.7 C increase that we've experienced to date if we continue on our current trajectory to 4 C or more. What this figure shows is where people are dying. And the green are you know, relatively low rates of mortality from climate change. Orange and red are where the impacts are being felt most significantly. So places where people are poor and vulnerable are being hardest hit. This next slide um, compares how much people in different countries have contributed and are contributing to global climate change and how much money we have. So the, uh, the second column is the uh, tons per year per person of CO2 being released. And we can see that the US and Canada, with annual emissions of 15 to 17 um, tons per year per person, have um, much, much higher emissions than those of, at the bottom, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where the average person contributes 0.1 tons. And that's uh, averaging up. Um, the, the final column there is the GDP of those countries um, in US dollars per person per year. Um, again, a contrast between Canada and the US with 35 to $40,000 per person per year and the Democratic Republic of the Congo where the average person um, earns $150 per year. That's where people are going to be most affected by our actions. Um, you can also see the Philippines there, one ton per person per year, a 15th of what we release, um, and an average GDP per person of 1,400. British Columbia, um, by virtue of having abundant hydropower, um, uh, has CO2 emissions slightly lower than the Canadian average, although still on the order of 10 tons per person per year. What this slide shows is um, a different way to think about British Columbia's impact on global climate change. The first column is the um, BC's own emissions, which the baseline for our policy 2007 was 67 um, million tons per year released in the province. Our goal is to re reduce that by a third by 2020. That would be to about 42 million tons per year. The final two columns is how much greenhouse gas emissions we are exporting in the form of fossil fuels. So already we are, in, we are exporting fossil fuels that will release three times as much as the emissions we're um, releasing within our province. And if all of the proposals go ahead for new mines, for coal exports, for bitumen pipelines, and for LNG, by 2020 that could increase to a factor of 10 times greater than our own emissions. And it's no accident that the countries that have the highest per capita emissions are wealthiest. We got wealthy by developing these resources by burning those fossil fuels. The International Energy Agency, which historically was a very conservative um, business-oriented body, itself has gotten, um, has been remarkably effective in sounding the alarm in the last few years. The most recent IEA report, um, those that came out this year are saying we're desperately running out of time if we're gonna meet the two degrees Celsius limit on global climate change that um, scientists have recommended and that the international community has agreed to. If we're gonna meet that limit, two thirds of known fossil fuel reserves will have to be left in the ground. And when we talk about the most greenhouse gas intensive of those energy sources, thermal coal, more than 80% of that thermal coal will have to stay in the ground if we're, we're, if we're to have even a 50% chance of meeting a two degree Celsius limit on climate change. That has important implications for investment in new infrastructure. And this is one thing I find 
Really frustrating is when the environmental community or academics speak out against new infrastructure projects, the argument is typically made they're against everything. Um, and, and I think that's not the case. Um, nobody is saying that we're going to stop using all fossil fuels overnight. We have to obviously reduce that over time. But there are very important reasons to oppose new infrastructure investments. First of all, they're going in the wrong direction, increasing our ex coal exports instead of decreasing them. Secondly, they are locking us into a path of reliance on fossil fuels for many decades. Nobody builds a new project and then shuts it down two years later. And finally, we are directing our scarce resources to investments in new fossil fuel infrastructure instead of clean energy alternatives. Um, Frank already mentioned some things that have been going on in the US. Um, the US has been shifting from reliance on coal uh, to produce its electricity to increasingly relying on natural gas. And that has reduced significantly US greenhouse gas emissions. They are now at the lowest point in 18 years. If, however, that surplus coal that people in the Powder River and other uh, coal producing regions find themselves with makes its way to new and expanding energy markets in Asia and, and elsewhere, those gains in reducing US greenhouse gas emissions will be undone. Um, you've already seen a figure here. The, the point I would want to make is um, there are a number of different proposals. Some have already been withdrawn to export that surplus coal through US ports. It is much harder to build a US coal port in the US that it is in Canada. The requirements to conduct an environmental impact assessment are much more thorough. They're more extensive. Uh, it takes a lot longer. Um, so if our neighbors to the south are successful in blocking several of those projects, um, and I do hope they will be, there will be increasing pressure to just keep that coal moving north and put it out through Canada. I don't believe that the Fraser Surrey docks project would stop at four or eight million tons once we remove um, the Massey Tunnel and can get ocean-going uh, tankers right up to the port. Another element of this, this is a picture of my own son, Sam, speaking, um, is what we are handing to our children and our grandchildren when we invest in and continue to invest in this fossil fuel economy, which is basically um, a 19th century economy. It's not doing them a favor to either hand them a fossil fuel economy that will saddle them with climate change or hand them a fossil fuel economy at a time when the world actually gets its act together and starts weaning uh, itself from fossil fuels. And they're, they're stuck with these, um, the equivalent of handing them the keys to a buggy whip factory. So why are we, why is this process so screwed up? Um, and I've never encountered anything quite like this as a political scientist. Um, I've been trying to make sense of it. There are a number of different players. First, we've got local governments um, and governments such as Metro Vancouver, Surrey, Vancouver, many others have spoken out in opposition to these projects. The problem is they don't have the authority to block it. They can speak on our behalf, and that's been very important, but they can't um, stop it. The British Columbia government does have authority as well. BC's leadership on climate change has been rapidly evaporating, unfortunately. And when it comes to coal, the premier and her ministers have been pretty happy to pass the buck to the feds and say, oh, this is a, this is a Port of Vancouver issue, it's federal. That is not entirely true. And the um, provincial authority is especially clear when it comes to um, the transfer facility at Texada Island. It is currently operating and is proposed to continue operating under a mining permit. It's not a mine. There once was a gravel mine there. It was never a coal mine, and a coal transfer facility is not a mine. Um, the independent uh, public health officers who are appointed by the provincial government are an exception, and they have been speaking out, uh, have been very power, a very powerful voice, and I think will continue to be so. This brings us to the feds. Federal government uh, has extensive authority over um, these matters through jurisdiction over international trade, um, uh, railroad lines and um, federal ports. And the, the actor who has been delegated to exercise federal authority in this case is the Fraser River Port Authority. They like to call themselves Port Metro Vancouver. That is their brand. Um, and I think the problem, whoa, 
Sorry. I'm so excited about the port. Um, the problem is the port is basically has a screwed up mandate. They have three quite distinct things that they're supposed to do and they're not compatible. The first is that they manage the federal government's public lands in the port. They, they own Canada Place Shopping Mall, for instance. They lease lands. Um, so they often call themselves a corporation. They're referred to as a crown corporation. They're not a crown corporation at all. Um, they talk about their customers, which I find particularly troubling because they are not a corporation. They do rely entirely for their operations on funds that are raised through leases and operation of their businesses, such as Canada Place. So that's function one. Function two is a traditional regulatory role of coordinating the users of the port, basically making sure everyone's got access to the shipping lanes and the ships don't run into each other. And consistent with that, the, the, um, the body that governs the port, they are appointed by federal cabinet. Our um, majority of them are nominated by the industries that use the port. So on the, the board of directors of the port is someone who previously was on the board of directors of the Coal Association of Canada. And the idea is that you know, they can work out who gets equal access. That becomes particularly problematic when we turn to the third function of the port, which is to protect the public's interest, including protecting public health and, um, and the environment. And there, there's a tension between the third function and both of the other ones. There's a tension with the first one because why would the port say no to a project that they rely on financially to maintain their own operations? It was deeply troubling that when we submitted access to information requests, I'm out of time. Okay, I'm gonna go really fast. Um, You've probably been doing that for a long time, Gail, and I didn't even notice. Um, when we submitted access to information requests to the port, um, they, they redacted a lot of the material because they had a financial interest in these regulatory matters. There's a tension, obviously, between um, having a board that is um, nominated by the industries that use the port and a responsibility for regulating the environmental impacts of those industries. So they are biased by design. I think there's still a lot we can do about that. In my um, comparative work as a political scientist, the only thing that ever makes a difference, and it can, yes, it can make a difference even with conservative governments, is the electorate. They report to us, they don't, you know, they don't have to come back uh, except every few years and I think politicians have been very nervous about taking long-term positions, taking positions that can be depicted as contrary to economic development because they don't trust that we'll back them up. And I think the only solution is for us to speak out in very large numbers and say that we will back them up and this is what we want. And I don't know about you, but I feel like the Canadian government and the positions they've been taking in Warsaw and on the international stage doesn't represent the Canadians that I know. Um, and they certainly don't speak for our children and our grandchildren's generation either, and I think we have to tell them that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. The proponents say this needs to be, one of the reasons that it needs to be done is for the job um, that will be created for it. Jobs are always a top political, you know, jargon that they throw out there that everyone gets behind. But there's different jobs. There's jobs that harm the environment, destroy the planet, and there's good jobs that are sustainable to the planet and provide a long-lasting economic benefit. To address this issue, Jeff Keithley will be talking. Jeff is the chair of the Sunshine Coast Senior Citizens, which is also known as Costco BC, and is one of the organizers of the Alliance for Democracy Sunshine Coast. Jill and his wife, Jill White, moved to the Half Moon Bay in 2008. Prior to this, uh, prior to the move, he was the executive director of the World Peace Forum, which organized a major international peace and anti-war anti forum at UBC in June of 2006. The forum ran for six days and was attended by over 5,000 people from almost 80 countries. Before that, Jeff was the national union representative for 25 years with the Canadian Auto Workers Union. He represented members working in the mining, manufacturing, and service sectors around British Columbia, conducting, conducting collective bargaining, legal representation, education, and organizing. During those years, he also served as the vice president of the BC Federation of Labor, organized in opposition, of, in opposition to various free trade initiatives, 
did extensive international solidarity work and was the founder of co-chair, yeah, <laughs> excuse me, and was the founding co-chair of Stop War, Greater Vancouver's Peace and Anti-War Movement. Please welcome Jeff Keithley. Thanks, Rick. Um, one of the things that's traditionally talked about when you raise issues of the environment is that they're just a bunch of tree huggers and they don't really care about jobs. Well, quite frankly, nothing could be further from the truth. We do care about jobs, but the question is what kind of jobs? Which kind of jobs are we going to create? Which kind of jobs are we going to protect? We have a federal and provincial government that's pushing us farther back in history towards being hewers of wood, drawers of water, uh, almost an exclusive reliance on res raw resource extraction. And while that does create some good jobs, it creates relatively few good jobs, and all resource-based economies are precarious, because when the boom is going, there's no place but up, and when, the, when, the, uh, when the, the bust happens, and it always does, there's no bottom, and millions of people are thrown out of work. Those are not healthy economies. The business community, or many in the business community, will say the mantra of the market will take place, will we'll look after it, that governments can't pick winners, that the private sector will be the proper, the proper driver. The problem with that is that that's a disingenuous position. Because the fact of the matter is, in every country around the world, private sector policies follow, don't, don't, don't lead, follow public sector policies and incentives. Let me give you a simple example, most dramatically with Alberta and the uh, tar sands. Prior to the development of the tar sands, the royalty that Alberta levied on conventional oil and gas was 25% of the gross throughput. In other words, they captured 25% of the value of the oil or gas as a public revenue. With the development of the tar sands, they created a new regime for, to promote it, and the royalty, and you won't believe this, is 1% of the net. In other words, they don't pay any royalties whatsoever until all their capital has been repaid, and then after that, they pay 1%. And then the federal government provides subsidies that cover off half of that 1%. For all intents and purposes, Alberta is giving away its petroleum resources. It has caused the energy companies to move out of conventional oil and gas into the tar sands. And right now, the Alberta government is in big trouble because their revenues have dropped like a stone because most of these companies aren't paying a cent into the, into the provincial treasuries to cover their services. Now compare that with Norway. Norway captures 70% of the gross value for their public reserves. And they put it into special funds and they don't run their budget based on that. They're saving it for a rainy day. And there are no international energy companies running away from Norway because they're charging 70%. The point to be made, both here and elsewhere, is that government policies really do matter. What we decide to tax or not tax, and how we decide to tax or not tax, and how we decide to regulate or not regulate, very substantially determines what happens. And when you're talking about raw resource extraction, to give you an example of what we're talking about, if you invest $4 million, $4 million in the oil and gas development industry, you will recreate one full-time job. Four million dollars investment creates one full-time job. If, on the other hand, you say we're going to have a green economy, we're actually going to try and conserve energy and get the most out of it so that we use the least to heat our houses, use the least to run our railways, all the rest of that. If you invest one million dollars in energy retrofits, you create 10 to 18 jobs, or 40 times the amount of jobs in the economy that the relative to oil and gas. If you uh, invest in waste management, you create 10 full-time jobs for $1 million. 
If you invest in public education, you create 16 jobs for every $1 million. So, and every single job, regardless of whether there's a resource or public sector, pays taxes to all levels of government to provide the services that we all need. So when we're looking at, when, we, when, the, when governments and corporations say to us, you are opposed to jobs, the answer is no, we're not. But you can redirect public policy so that it creates far more jobs, far more beneficial jobs with greater impact within the long term and the short run by changing policy. So I want to quickly run through a few areas where governments ought to, ought to invest. And by that doesn't mean they have to directly invest, they can do it by their policies. We need massive investments in the forest industry. We need massive re reforestation. Uh, one hectare of forest absorbs the, the CO2 of 100 cars for, for each hectare. We need massive investment in K-12, in, in early childhood education, and in technical, vocational, and academic, and arts training so that we can keep up with the modern economy. We need to invest in efficient transportation. We need to wean ourselves off, as has been said before, fossil fuel consumption. Not, we can't say no immediately, but we do have to wean ourselves off because you can't make those kind of investments and not lock yourself in. And we have government powers if we Ma uh, master the political will to change how we choose to invest and how we choose to use our tax base, we can create tons of new jobs. And these are not pie in the sky, we'll pay, do it later sometime when we can afford it. It can be done now and a big chunk of our job here is to ensure that we begin to build the political will to in fact build a green economy. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Our last speaker is our local MLA, Nicholas Simons. Nicholas will explain politically how, we're, how and why we're in the situation where such a project can occur without mandatory environmental assessments. <laughs> Somewhat. He, he, he's, he's bad in last, but he's gonna have to kind of fill in with you what he's gonna say. Um, he will also share his view on the issue. Nicholas was first elected as MLA for Powell River Sunshine Coast in 2005 and was re-elected to his third term in May. He has spent over 15 years working in the areas of health, justice, social services, and child welfare. He has served as opposition critic for community living and deputy critic for social development and housing. He is currently the opposition critic for agriculture. He has a bachelor's and master's degree in criminology. Please welcome Nicholas Simons. Well, well, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, it's really nice to be here. Thank you very much to the organizers for taking this risk. Um, I'm, yeah, it shouldn't be too much of a risk, actually. I have five minutes, five minutes more than I've had since November 2012 in the legislature of the British Columbia. And therein lies the problem, ladies and gentlemen. 36 days we've sat since November this time last year. 36 days in the provincial legislature. So where are these issues being debated? I'll tell you how I got involved in this issue. I got a call saying there are folks on Texada who found out that the local quarry was about to get a permit amendment to their mining permit. One, to extend the length of their conveyor belt, and one, to increase their storm management, because they're going to have some more coal sitting there. By the way, Texada has handled coal for 20 years, coal from Quinsum Mine, and it just comes over on barge and then goes overseas on the big bulk carriers. So I said, okay, well, permit, I'll phone the Ministry of Mines. And I phoned the Ministry of Mines and said, what do we do? The public wants some input into this because it, it's all about increasing coal exports. Oh, there's no, there's no public hearing for that. It's just a permit amendment. It's a permit amendment. What does the public know about conveyor belt extensions? And I said, well, you know, they might want to have something to say about the overall picture of coal. Like, who's talking about coal? And so I started to do a little bit of research. And it's not just the development of a four million metric ton coal export facility in Fraser River. It's that every one of the four coal export terminals in British Columbia has expanded significantly over the last four years. If you look at Ridley Terminals up in Prince Rupert, they've managed to expand their coal export capacity from something like nine million metric tons to 18 and a half million metric tons per year. 
and that's Prince Rupert. Neptune has also practically doubled their export capacity. We see the same thing at West Shore, and now we see the same thing happening at Fraser Surrey Docks. So we're not just looking at, at 4 million new metric tons of coal, we're looking at an increase from about 46 million metric tons a year to about 95 million metric tons a year without one discussion with the public, with the only official thing we've had is a mine permit amendment on Texada Island at the com community hall to talk about wastewater management, stormwater management. It's like, well, okay, well, that's the state of our democracy, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm not too pleased about it myself. I think that this is the kind of event that needs to make sure people are aware of what's actually happening, and I'm not making this up. I think we really need to have a discussion. If we're going to approve the increase uh, in the improvement or the, no, the creation of new infrastructure, we were talking, to, we're 2013, we're talking about coal exports. We had debates over, you know, damming the rivers and plugging the lakes and the IPPs and we've had biomass and we've had waste energy and meanwhile, in another part of the forest, we've got these people running coal through our backyard. And here we are as a province and we're in our house and we're standing there and suddenly someone runs behind you and says, what, what the heck was that? That was the federal government tromping through your kitchen <laughs> with coal on her feet or his feet. And I think that we have a fundamental problem because we don't have a provincial government that's prepared to stand up and say, you know, we don't just have a local, regional, provincial concern about coal exports. We are citizens of the world and we know what happens to that coal. And where is the opportunity for the public to have a discussion about this? At the very least. So, so in, order, in order to... To, to be able to talk about this issue without being accused of being against jobs, let's remember that it's a lot harder to cut down on jobs than not to create them in the first place. And if we're creating jobs that we know are bad for the environment, that we know are going to undermine our abilities to reach our targets, if not statistically, at least ethically, uh, I, think, I think the public deserves better than that. And I have a lot of statistics. Um, thank you for the 50 minutes you gave me, by the way. I didn't realize I had... <laughs> 50, 50 minutes, really, I don't need that many. But uh, here's, the, here's the point. So I wrote, I wrote to the Minister of, of Environment, Mary Polak. I said, you know, this is, this is not just a concern for Fraser Surrey Docks. It's not just an environmental assessment that ends at the mouth of the river, which is the current situation. They're looking at the noise, they're looking at the dust, they're looking at you know, the marine navigation hazards, everything else, right to the mouth of the Fraser. And there's nothing from there to Texada. So I'm not going to say that this is the most dangerous channel in the world, and I'm not going to be a fear monger. But at the very least, the public should have an opportunity to look at the science, to look at what the experts have said, and base their decision on that. Not being called a NIMBY, and not being called anti-jobs, saying that you're standing up for the environment. You should have an opportunity to see those, that science. So, I'm de I, so I wrote, I said, you know, at the very least, can we have these assessments? We need to know what happens if that coal, something happens to the double barged coal. We're not talking, like, in the Fraser River, they're just pulling one at a time. Up here, they're pulling two at a time. I don't know how much a difference that makes, but I'm not, if, if I don't ask those questions and if we don't get answers to the questions, we have a right uh, to be concerned. So, just between Laskiti and Texada Island, you know, that's, that's the area, the Sabine Channel. And right in that area, we have a provincial park, a Sabine Channel Provincial Park, South Texada Island Provincial Park, Jedediah Island Marine Provincial Park, Squiddy Bay Provincial Park, and I believe there's also a fish conservation area in there. And, you know, I want to know that my government cares enough to assess what potential harms there are, and if they find none, then let's have a discussion about the larger issues as well while we're at it. But until then, make a lot of noise. I'll try and do my part, and uh, we'll see what happens. But thank you very much.
All right. Thank you very much, Nicholas. That was great. Um, we're running a little bit late. We're going to uh, have a question and answer discussion period now. We hope you can stick around. Um, if you do have to leave, there are, remember, there are petitions over the sign on the side. If you uh, take a look to see if you want to sign those, um, hopefully you can stick around. We're going to open up our panel to a few more speakers. Um, and then we're going to have open microphones so people can ask these speakers questions. If you have uh, information that you'd like to share with other people, please do so. Um, our, no, you guys can stay here too. Yeah, yeah. No, Nicholas. We're adding. We're adding another panelist. We had a lot of people who are interested in this or uh, what like to speak. First, I'd like to introduce Jeremy Valeriotti. Jeremy is uh, on the board of directors of the Sunshine Coast Conservation Association. Jeremy is a professional engineer who has made a career in environmental impact assessment and environmental rem remediation. He believes that great communication, science, and education are the keys to finding a balance between human development and environmental integrity. He's an outdoor person who moved to the Sunshine Coast in 2008 and is excited to participate in the ongoing dialogue about the future of this part spectacular part of the world. Please welcome Jeremy. And Jeremy, do you mind give, giving a few words about the Sunshine Coast Conservation Association and their interest in this issue? Thank you, yes. Um, the Sunshine Coast Conservation Association, as many of you know, has a biodiversity focus. Uh, so that is, that is our main, main concern, is uh, impacts to the marine environment uh, from, from these the proposed facilities. So uh, Jason Hertz is the chair and was involved in the organization of, of this day, which has been excellent, thank you. Uh, and that, that is the reason for, for we obviously have uh, an interest in the climate change aspect as it relates to the biodiversity as well. Uh, so that is the SCCA's main focus. Thank you. Next on the uh, added panel will be Diane Sanford. She's a local resident here. Diane has a diploma in technology from BCIT, Fish and Wildlife, and studied environmental conservation at Lethbridge College. She is sole proprietor of Moonstone Enterprises since 1996 and provides environmental education and monitoring services. Many children on the Sunshine Coast know her through the Salmonids on the classroom program, and she holds the education coordinator contracts for fisheries and oceans. She is volunteer coordinator for Sunshine Coast Friends of Forage Fish, coordinating volunteer sampling of for sand, sand lance and surf smelt, and a director with the Seagrass Conservation Working Group. Diane has been mapping and monitoring eelgrass on the Sunshine Coast since 2001 and is a stream keepers trainer. Please welcome Diane Sanford. And Diane, could you give a few words about um, your specialty and how it applies here? Uh, my lifetime uh, specialty, I suppose you could say, is our shorelines. Um, my interest has always been with our shorelines. They're very, very vulnerable um, interfaces between land and ocean, and they are also very vulnerable. We do have a volunteer group, the Sunshine Coast Friends of Forage Fish. We've been volunteer sampling for the last four years. We do have positive beaches for surf smelt and sand lands. Uh, these fishes are primary uh, food chain species, very vulnerable to what happens in our oceans and on our lands as well. And uh, these fishes also comprise 50 to 75 percent of adult salmonid food sources and so are very important to us. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next we have Caroline Leishman. Caroline is a co-founder of Pebble and Pebble in the Pond Environmental Society in Powell River. She sat on the committee to create the sustainability charter for Powell River and region. For her day job, she is a built green CBC builder and architectural designer. She started working on the coal, coal expansion issue this summer and has been working with communities in coal, voters taking action on climate change, and the Dogwood Initiative to raise awareness uh, of the expansion on Texada and in the Powell River area. Please welcome Carol Ann. 
I've been tackling this issue up in Powell River and Texada and uh, just trying to get as much information and facts as possible because the Texada residents are cons the people that work for Lafarge Canada on Texada who are the barge transporters of the coal are very concerned about jobs because Lafarge Canada has been telling them they're going to create 15 to 20 really good paying jobs on Texada which is questionable whether that's true. Um, but to give you an idea, the barges, Lafarge, one thing that they're clinging to, I think, is that the, the increase in the amount of barges of the thermal coal, um, they've been, they have, as Nicholas mentioned, they've been uh, storing and shipping coal from British Columbia and primarily metallurgical coal for 20 years through Texada of uh, 400,000 metric tons a year, and the increase is up to 8 million tons. And probably more because they say they can handle 10 million tons a year or 16 million tons a year gets thrown around. So there's no, once they do the expansion, there's really no regulation process of, of limiting that. And also just for a background, um, our regional health officer, Dr. Paul Mardike, recently wrote a letter stating that Lafarge Canada has, was notified in 2009 by the Powell River Drinking Water Health Officer that they have been contaminating the watersheds on Texada, the drinking water. Since 2009, they were notified to clean up their act because they're contaminating it with heavy metals, uh, arsenic, mercury, cadmium, other heavy metals and nitrates, and have done nothing since 2009. And now the expansion to increase these coal piles with now thermal coal is very disconcerting to the residents of Texada. And really until we brought uh, Dr. James up to Texada recently, and I had written a letter and presented to the Palover Regional District who voted unanimously in favor of the expansion because of the jobs aspect, the residents of Texada knew nothing. Only people who worked directly for Lafarge were aware of it and of course were in favor of the jobs, but no residents, there was no public process, nobody knew about it. Dr. James came there and we did a presentation and people were absolutely horrified and appalled that this would get basically snuck through as a permit amendment with no public consultation process and no environmental impact assessment or health impact assessment being required outside of Fraser River. So this is what we're tackling from that aspect. Thank you very much, Caroline. <laughs> and last but not least is Laura Benson. Laura currently directs Dogwood Initiatives Beyond Coal Campaign. She lives in Vancouver and recently obtained a master's degree in urban studies at Simon Fraser University. Prior to that, she lived in San Diego, California, where she worked as a community organizer for a municipal living wage campaign, a political organizer on a progressive mayoral campaign, and as a campaign director at Environmental Health Coalition, a local environmental justice organization. She is ecstatic to work for the Dogwood Initiatives a dogwood, excuse me, a dogwood initiative as Dogwood's approach reflects the values and lessons her experience have taught her. That nothing matters more than sustaining our most fundamental resources, our air, our land, our water, and ourselves. And that the only way to do this is by building power with people. Please welcome Laura. Thanks, Rick. I wasn't where you, uh, you were going to get my full bio, but now you know me a little better. Um, so yeah, I'm, Dogwood Initiative is just one of the many organizations that are working with, we're working with our partners like voting t Voters Taking Action on Climate Change, Power Past Coal in the United States, to support this grow, ever-growing network of local organizations and residents like yourselves, like Carol Ann, like all of us who are really going to be the ones that make a change in this in this situation, and we're so we're working to build a network of people across BC who want to say over things like this that will affect our future, and we're going to build our, ourselves into a force that just can't be ignored. So that's that's our piece in this work. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Now, um, why don't we start over here? Do you have a question? Yep. Um, uh, 
um, for the for the marine, you know, and uh, fish and mammals um, of the increased uh, boat traffic in our waters. We've been The marine mammal issue is a very, very substantial one. I'm not an expert in that, but I've been on panels with other people speaking on it, and it, it's a massive issue. Running both the barges, but primarily the ships, has a sound uh, impairment. They, they, they guide themselves, and they communicate each other. They know where other animals are only through the sound that they make. And these ships make, uh, dis destroy that, their ability to do that. So I think it's, it's a major impact. I'm not an expert on it, but I think that uh, that's certainly something's been raised by people that are experts as a major problem with it. It's, it's one I don't think they've addressed. And I don't, actually don't know anything about the, the solar power and wind power capacity within Canada. Um, the, only, the only thing that it's going to make, you know how bad I am with this thing. Um, the only thing that is going to encourage redirection of investment away from fossil fuels into cleaner energy is to put a price on carbon and to gradually increase that price. BC adopted an amazing policy in our carbon tax. It's being discussed around the world. It's been frozen now in BC and that's really um, deterring the kind of innovation and redirection of investment that we need to see. And, and the magic of that is that it will prompt entrepreneurs to figure out where to put their money that it will pay off the best and it won't be in coal. Thank you. Let me, let me add to the answer, sorry I'll be quick. Um, I'm a biologist by training. I don't know specifically about the question of the impact of increased noise on the marine ecosystem, but somebody knows that, there are some experts, and these kinds of this kind of information, these kinds of facts, are what we need in order to make an informed decision. Thank you. Gentleman on the microphone there. Are, are, comments, are comments allowed? Is yeah, please. Uh, I'm Kevin. I've got a bachelor's degree in documentaries. If there was such, such a thing, I just watch a lot of documentaries. Um, if we looked at the land up above here and saw the landfill that is up there, we would see that a lot of it is filled with plastics, and a lot of those plastics are also here in our oceans, and as far as I'm concerned, we have Christmas approaching, and we can make a major contribution to the demand of the oil, the char sands that are coming from Alberta, and the pipeline wanting to go to the Kitimat, and the coal going out of BC and elsewhere, if we don't buy the stuff shoving down our throats. It ends up in the garbage pile. We are responsible for this demand. 200 more million people are expected in China and they're going to be needing bricks. If they stripped off the top layer of land to get the coal and to use that soil as bricks, 25% of the land on the surface would be removed, which is agricultural land, to build these bricks for the homes. Um, if you've all got a pen and a piece of paper, you want to write this down, this is an excellent, excellent documentary. It's called, and it is on Netflix, it's called Death by China. It's, it's a must watch, it's not funny. And it was thank you. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Mel Matthews and I'm from the Gibsons area. I thank you all for attending and, and taking your time to do this for us today. This is so important. And I'd like to read you a little item. This is from Western Organization and Resource Council, export, pardon me, exporting power, uh, powder, river basin, coal, risks and costs. And this is from January 2011. It says here, increasing coal train traffic will leave large amounts of coal dust in communities across the West. Each coal rail car loses roughly 500 pounds of coal and coal dust per rail car, over 30 pounds per unit train during each trip. Increased coal traffic, uh, pardon me, increased coal train traffic will cause more air and water pollution along the rail lines. Coal dust 
can also have a detrimental effect on the rail track beds, which can lead to an increased need for repair and more derailments. That's just a little statement, but my question now is to Nicholas. We, the people, have been given 30 days to comment. Is there a possibility that you can fight to extend that time, which we really need? Thank you. Thank you. Well, as I understand it, the commenting is to the Port Metro Vancouver, correct, Val? So the comment period is to Port Metro Vancouver, controlled entirely by the federal government appointees. We have one progressive voice on that board, Penny Pretty. Um, there's one person appointed by Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia, and the rest are appointed by the government of Canada. And uh, they are very steadfast in protecting their jurisdiction. I think that we can expose the fact that we have a non an unaccountable body making decisions on behalf of uh, us without any environmental or health impact assessments. And I think that might, if there's enough public pressure, anything's possible. And that certainly would be a good start. The recent study that was returned after two weeks, uh, I think, made most medical health officials chuckle with disdain because it was just woefully inadequate, as everyone's called it. There's no word worse than woefully inadequate. <laughs> really, really woefully inadequate, <laughs> I think. Thank you. Gentlemen, over here. Oh, Laura, go ahead. Sorry. Just shout. <laughs> I just wanted to add, and correct me if I'm wrong, MLA Simons, but um, the, the province does have a say in whether this project will go ahead. And the province should be doing a better job of assessing it. So the port has refused to assess impacts up to Te Texada Island and along the, your coast here. Who's going to do that? Well, the province should. It is in their jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. They should be doing a far better job than uh, an amendment of a mining permit, and we absolutely have the right to demand that. So there's far more to be done on the provincial side. We need to be talking to our Minister of, of Environment. We need to be talking to our Minister of Health about a health impact assessment that will cover all of our communities. Um, it's not over even when the 30-day comment period is over. Just one additional thing. There's actually a second, there's also a permit required down there uh, through, um, for, uh, through Metro Van, uh, they have an air, air pollution permit or an air quality permit that they have to get. And so that's, got, that's gonna have, they just applied for it now. They were asserting they didn't need it. And they realized that in fact enough people are watching that they do need it. So there will be a second opportunity on, on, the, on the air quality permit as well. Anyone else? Nope. Okay, gentlemen on the right hand side. Uh, yeah, Ray Eagle from Gibsons. Uh, I wanted to address uh, an issue that hasn't been raised by uh, anybody on either the panel or, or uh, the, the present people in front of us. Uh, Nicholas almost touched on it, but we're exercised about the barges going from Westport up to Texada but have you realized that if Kinder Morgan gets its way, doubles the pipeline to Barad Inlet, and then the tanker increase is something like five times what it is now, we're gonna have a, a musical ride in the lower Strait of Georgia with the barges going from Westport to Texada, with the tankers going from Barad Inlet out through crossing the, the barges uh, on its way to through the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And then the barges having got to Texada, the tankers will then be loaded and going south to join the, uh, the, the Kinder Morgan tankers. And then you've got the summer cruise ship trade and then you've got the regular ferry routes and then you've got the existing grain ships coming in out of the harbor, it is going to be a very interesting situation. And I, this has not been addressed. We're, we're so exercised about the barges 
that we forget this potential musical ride, which being cynical, I'm sure that uh, these will be allowed and come to pass. I, I hope to God I'm wrong, but uh, that, that's, that's my reading. So I think it's something that we should really be looking at because can you imagine what's going to happen in the lower strait of Georgia with the barges going... And I also forgot the fact that the empty barges have got to get back. So it's going to be... Sorry? As well. Right. So um, uh, I, I just want to bring this to your attention in the hope that this will become a, a major issue in this whole concept of, uh, of um, uh, and yeah, sure. there could be a risk assessment, but we know the, uh, the number of marine accidents that have happened worldwide, uh, to typically uh, the um, Exxon Valdez, uh, millions and millions of gallons of, of oil worldwide that have been spilt, and possibly the, um, the simplest one was the one that took, took place in the English Channel not too long ago, where the guy who was supposed to close the doors on, on the motor vehicle ferry was asleep in his bunk. Uh, and, and that's just a simple way of uh, e explaining what can happen by, by way of marine traffic. Um, just very quickly, uh, it's difficult to um, have a, a long memory do you remember when Bill Bennett, when he was Premier, said, BC is not for sale? That was back in the late 1970s. And uh, just one more thing that I've been dying to say, and this is a, a good time to sell it. Our wonderful Premier, uh, she has taken positive thinking to new heights with, with her talk about LNG and so on. I'm damn sure if there was a 10-point earthquake tomorrow, she would find something positive to say about it. Okay. Just to add to your argument, if you look at what the federal government is doing with Coast Guard at the very same time that you're talking about this new ballet happening in the Georgia, in the Salish Sea, the Coast Guard cuts not just to the lower mainland, but Cape Lazo across the way next near... Uh, Comox is going to schedule to close as well, so I, I don't see a lot of that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi, I was wondering if the two scientists, or two of the scientists, could describe roughly what the wind would be doing with this coal dust here in Seashell, Roberts Creek, Gibsons. How much of that coal dust will we be seeing on our cars in the morning, on our houses, on our windows, approximately? I don't know. And I think that the answer is complicated, but it has to be looked at. Uh, in this particular case, the devil isn't really in the details, meaning we have to do extensive modeling that looks at what are the loads of dust that are lost in one particular trip, model uh, the weather patterns, and then decide how far the dust will be blown, where it'll end up. And, and that's something that's complicated. I can tell you that this is very complicated, and it takes months of efforts to carry out. So the answer is, you will not know until somebody who's expert in it can actually run out the, the exercise of modeling it and come up with an answer. It, it's worse than you think. Um, what they know about the train cars is that <clears throat> they were able to reduce uh, by about 85 percent the amount of dust that blew up by putting a, a coating on top, a topping they were talking about. <clears throat> on the barges, they're going to put that topping on with absolutely no experience. No one's ever done that before, ever. They have no idea if it will work. They have no idea what the consequence will be. E and, and, and even, even when they did do it on the trains, you still have 15% of the stuff coming off, even with those, those, those toppings. The main thing is we have no idea. And they, they're going to prove this not having any idea. They don't know the safety of this stuff, not just the coal, but the shrapnel that they're going to put on it. They have no idea if that's safe once it goes in the ocean. And they're planning on approving this 
with absolutely no information about that. And that's not just true for this example. It's true for a dozen things I can think of and probably three dozen more. And that's a great example, though. No one knows. And the fact that no one knows, that's the problem. Thank you. Yes, sir. Again, with the health impacts, it, dep it matters if you're upwind or downwind, uh, but, but not to know is ridiculous. Uh, what I'm going to suggest is that the speak we'll hear from the speakers at the microphones now, and then we'll try and move through as quickly as possible. Uh, so please don't somebody else decide to get up. I have to say, because I'm going to say no. Just one important aspect. Andre mentioned that all these questions are extremely complicated. They're also very expensive to, to resolve. And I think it exposes a, a structural flaw. There have been many criticisms of the environmental impact process. Um, and one of the issues in, in trying to protect biodiversity is ensuring that there's a robust science-based impact assessment. Now, the, the main difficulty with that is that the assessments are all proponent funded. So if something is very expensive to, to, to find the answer to and very difficult, uh, the proponent is not always willing to spend that money. And, and I'm saying this from a, a professional point of view, as, uh, with a background as a consultant, it is extremely difficult to uh, convince proponents that they should fund these things. So um, I don't know where the, the, what the root cause of that is, but I suspect it's a, it's a fundamental disrespect of, of science and the scientific process, and it's coming from, from decision makers and, and other as, elements of society. Next speaker. Uh, thank you. Just quickly to answer the gentleman that was ahead of me about the increased marine traffic ballet. At least be thankful uh, BC Ferries is cutting some of their runs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Anyhow, um, what I just looked around noticed in here when we had our a number, there was, I could count in one hand and have a few fingers left on how many people th that were here in the audience that were under 30 who have the most at stake. And even in general, I'm seeing basically, I recognized 80% of the same people that were here. In my opinion, this should have been standing room only. We should have had speakers out in the parking lot, which was full, people lined up down the laneways to come into this. And I know this has been asked before, how do we reach the other 20, on the Sunshine Coast, the other 29,800? How do we make them aware? How do we get them involved? How do we get them to see how serious it is? Because like several people said, it is citizens that will count. It is numbers that will count. One or 200 of us won't do it, but 29,000 of us here and hundreds of thousands of us in British Columbia will, is one question. The second one I have is we see, we're sort of in the middle of this. It starts at the Powder River Basin and ends in China. Um, to stop a lot of this here is, I mean, the coal mining is increasing in Powder River as well as Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky. They're stripping whole mountaintops off at an ever-increasing rate. How do we get them to start reducing that and leading to other renewable resources? And then that will take the pressures from what we're trying to stop here. Maybe Carolyn and Laura. What I'd suggest, we're going to do, when we get to the wrap-up, we're going to say, what can we do next? And maybe that's, uh, Dale, a point for that part of the discussion. Perfect. Me now? Yeah. Well, my name is Lori Dixon. I'm a, lo I'm a lifelong coaster. And um, I really appreciated all the speakers and the panels. And... I, this is the second climate change meeting I've gone to today. And uh, it's, it's very disconcerting to hear people um, talking ab about the climate in a way that makes me grimly say that we're at the end of an epoch of where people took and base an economy on low-growing fruit. They've taken the easiest route to the most accessible, 
resources, built an economy on that, and now we have to change or die. So I, I'm getting more and more interested in these issues because I'm a grandmother to 12 and soon to be a gran great grandmother to four. And I said it this, this morning that I don't want to be speaking to my growing great-grandchildren about planning to move 300 miles inland and maybe 300 miles up and still be a waterfront community. Climate change is nothing to sneeze at. And um, I also am very concerned when people talk about water. Uh, I'm concerned about fracking. I'm going to get very involved in that. Poisoning our water is it's not something that there should be a law enabling, law enabling that. But I wanted to start out with two grim, sort of like humor things. One is that somewhere earlier today, someone talked about um, the, the lack of consultation. Well, as a First Nations, <laughs> I want to say we've been talking about the lack of consultation for 500 years. OK, and the, the, other, the other thing uh, relates to Mr. Keeley and the reason I'm still active in my community other than in my family is the green economy. I'm a big supporter. But now we've got to get away from talking about the green economy and actually funding research and innovation. Um, and that brings me to a vital point in that we're here and we have the benefit of Nick Simons uh, representing BC. But where's our representation in Ottawa? The omnibus bills have stripped environmental protections. There's no one here to defend or tell us why, when we all know why, really. It's to push through this last shove for low growing fruit and, and a dying economy. Get rid of the last things. And now there, another country is using us as a dumping ground. That's in effect what I feel about it. So I will be here to sign a petition. I want to hear, a big thing for me is innovation. Old ideas need not apply. They don't work anymore. They never have, really. And we need to really hold up the push for science. And here I'll say I'm a school trustee, so science in schools. Um, happily, for, for participation in our schools by people like Mrs. Sanford here is raised consciousness amongst all the young people here in School District 46. That is there. And I wanted to also make a comment that involves um, Regional District Area D Representative Donna Sugar. We were at a meeting earlier last week and someone brought up the point about there's, there's very few young people here well, it goes to low-growing fruit. Times have changed, folks. Um, Donna brought up the fact that a lot of young people don't like to come to, um, to meetings. They're too busy. And in today's economy, they're tired. Some people have to work three jobs, three part-time jobs in order to live here. So we have to change our way of doing things. We have to look at digital ways of uh, getting information out and getting opinion in. And that's really um, a strong statement that, that everyone here has to really listen, I think, because I've heard it, I, I go to a lot of meetings, so I've heard it three times this week about this fact that there are very few young people. 
um, attending these things. And I don't think it's not that they're not interested, they're just tired. So I really um, hold my hands up to people who consistently show up to these meetings. And we have to be more strident in how we express ourselves and be more public. And I'll be there. Hi, I'm, S I'm Sally Abraham. And um, simply, I, this might be covered, but I'm here because I want someone to delineate and write down what each of us can do to help stop this. Thanks. Just to quickly comment on that, really, you have three weeks, you know, and we have to make a concerted effort to, to each individual speak out and the website that, that Owen has put up. We need to comment on that. It's a resource and there's lots of information there and it's an opportunity for you to give input and we have to talk to each other as a community. Um, but, we, uh, I, I'm also the health officer of the Nooksack tribe and, and tribal people, they get it. They understand this. Every tribe I've ever spoken with, they understand. But, but they have to be heard too. The same thing with youth. Sam, uh, uh, Ms. Harrison's son, he's organized students in his school and in other schools. Students, young people get it. They don't need the lecture. They under, they're ready for action. We need to give them tools to act though, which I think is what you were asking for, right? Yeah, I want to know what to do. I still don't know what to do. That's gonna be in our wrap up if we ever get okay. to it. Okay. Good evening, or good afternoon. Um, Chief Gary Festet from the Seashell First Nation. My ancestral name is Akista, and I just wanted to really thank you for the information today, but I really think one component is left out, and I really have to stress that. Why aren't you working with the First Nation? I know John wanted us to sit on the panel. I have a hard time sitting on a panel because I'm not a stakeholder in my own territory. We own our territory. Um, and that's one of the things, but I really hope that you will align yourself with the First Nations because I went through all this information, been doing a lot of reading in the last little while, and I noticed that they've had some meetings with Tawasin and Musqueam. Um, we're gonna now align ourselves with our coastal First Nations to see how we can come together, but I'm hoping that we can align with the people in this room to come with, up with a coordinated approach. Because when you talked about the accumulative effects, well, I think we have to look beyond that. I can do a presentation here today and show you the cumulative effects that's happening within my territory. Every single square inch of my territory is either tenured, permitted, or has a project on it. And it's really infringing on the rights of my people. And when you talked about the herring spawn, well, there's a picture of my grandmother up there. I was raised by my grandparents just down the road here. We used to live off the land when I was a little boy. We used to go out into the waterfront and gather all the shellfish, all of the herring, the herring spawn. Porpoise Bay, the elders still talk about the herring spawn was so massive in Porpoise Bay, you could only leave your net in the water for 20 minutes, otherwise you wouldn't be able to li lift it out of the water. That's how much herring spawn was in Porpoise Bay. Well, we can't do that anymore. And it's because of the cumulative effects that has been happening on our territory. And I think one thing is missing in all of your presentations, where that, those barges and those ships are going is a major area that our people still fish. That area that it's gonna be coming through, the, all of the major salmon runs come through that area and that's where our people rely on our food, social and ceremonial and, they're, and they are protected in the Constitution. There's section 35 rights and they are protected. <laughs> So we have joined with the SCRD on doing a joint statement, a joint press release, but we are now gonna align with our neighboring First Nations and I'm hoping we can align with all of you because we are gonna be asking for an extension because if they're gonna infringe on our rights, well then they better grant that extension because otherwise they're just gonna come, they're just gonna be in court.
And I, and I just wanted to, to thank you for all the information, but I really hope that from here on in, uh, if I didn't sit on the regional board as a director, I wouldn't even be getting any of this information. Even my MLA, I mean, I don't, don't want to scold you in public, but you're not, even, you're, not even CCing, you're not even CCing the First Nations on your letters. And that, that has to stop, and I'm, I'm hoping it will stop from this day on, because we're wanting to work with you people. Thank you. I, I, um, in Powell River, we have the Slyaman First Nation, and I do hope that you will get in contact with them and um, discuss collaborating with them. Uh, we brought Dr. James up to Slyaman. Unfortunately, Lafarge has had communications with the chief and council in which they have basically offered them jobs and said if they don't, if they can sign off on this expansion, then they will benefit from it. So they, they refuse to um, basically work with us. They don't, they don't want to work with our group and, and they ha I've sent them information and they basically reject it. So there's a, there's a part of the community that ha is, is very concerned about it and they are trying to get information and we had a small public meeting in Slyaman with Dr. James and they were very concerned. But there's a real, real difficulty in getting the information out through through SLAM and Council, and they allowed us to use their hall, but they refused to come to the meeting, and they refused to align themselves in any way. So it was very, it was very disconcerting to us, but we were trying to get that information out there, so if any other First Nations are willing to work with them and try and, co you know, coalition, that would be really, really beneficial, because it absolutely is all of your territory. Can I also say, Chief, that the, the Lummi people have been very outspoken about this and they have their best scientists working on it, their tribal leadership working on it, and they've taken the leadership role. I've supported them in that and I'll continue to do that and I'd be happy to reach out to, and help in any way that I can. Um, it, what's happening to you has happened to everybody. It's, not, it's, it's, it's across the board. Uh, in, in the States, though, in the U.S., the, the, the tribes have been very organized and I think have taken the most important leadership role in the opposition. Everybody from the Yakima to, to, the, to the Lummi have taken a very active role and uh, they have been heard. Um, so I, I hope that you'll be willing to work with us and I'll, I personally will be willing to work with you in any way that I can. I think I can speak for all three sponsoring age, uh, groups today that we'd be delighted to work with you, Gary. I'm the last yeah. person. Um, Gail Nielsen. Thank you so much to all the speakers. Very impressive. And the panelists. And I really appreciate you all giving up your time for this really, really important issue. Um, I'd like to just say that I, I hope that we can carry on the conversation. I'm um, part of a Green Films group. We're showing in two nights from now, Do the Math, which is about climate change. That's going to be at the Heritage Theatre on um, Monday night at 7.30. And um, our discussion afterwards is very much focused on solutions. Um, I've got, I left some of these little flyer things around the room, so be sure to pick one up if you're interested in coming out. And then the, the last thing I, I was gonna mention, and, and probably this is uh, what you're about to say anyway, Jeff, is uh, that I, because we're we're really focused on solutions in this, um, the movie night we're having in two nights. I just kind of did want to hear from, um, from the people that came out here today, uh, your ideas about solutions to the fossil fuel economy, and I know it, it has been touched on, but how do we move forward? I guess that's the question. How do we move forward? Like I've been to a lot of different protests and things like that, and you know, we're, we are, we are objecting to the what's the, the fossil fuel in, infrastructure, but we also have to move forward and provide solutions to what is happening right now in our society, which is under uh, pressure from extreme extraction. So I guess that's what, how I wanted to you know a ask everybody. But I think you're going to be doing that anyway. Thank you all again for being here. It's, it's been great.
Thank you, Gail. Now we're going to switch over to our um, panel of kind of uh, uh, leading off from where she was saying what people can do. What are the exact uh, steps and people can take? First, I'd like to bring back Owen. Um, and we'll hear from Carol Ann and Laura, and they'll give you specific things that you can do to help out in the cause. Owen? Thank you. So, as I went into in great detail before, the site is very, very important for this whole process, realporthearings.org. Now, a bunch of us are updating this with brand new information all the time. Um, Frank has contributed a huge amount of work to it as well. Um, and also very crucial on there is any letters of support from any communities, First Nations, anything like that at all uh, is being compiled on that website. I'm also producing um, a shareable document which will be able to bring into any government offices, which would be like a you know, 10, 15 page with links to the latest um, government re resolutions. Um, so the key is to funnel everything through this site and your comments, it's realporthearings.org, okay? And it's the only place your comments are gonna get seen. If you send them to, to the port, they will vanish. We will never see them. And at the very least, we'll have a record of what was said. Um, and it's, it's aggravating Port Metro Vancouver. There, there's been lots of uh, talk back and forth about it. And uh, this is what they should have done. We put up comments about what the US process was and the comments were live in the United States. 125,000 comments. You can see exactly who said what on all levels. Of the Frank said the other day, it's a, four, it's a 400 page document of the government comments, government and uh, various departments, 400 pages long, uh, plus 125,000 comments. What did we get? Okay, we got 30 days to comment to send, you may as well send it to a junk mail folder. So right now that's, we're putting a huge amount of focus into this site because we need to comment on it. And the biggest thing is that we need to comment on the fact that the, the process is so flawed that it needs to be scrapped and we need to bring everyone who, who, everyone needs to come to the table and decide this process. Not a few people who are appointed by the port or basically who are the people who make the money from it to decide. The, but the, the key is absolute transparency. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carol Ann, your suggestions? Yeah, I, there's that saying, tell two friends and so on and so on and so on. In our community, that's the, the, probably the most impactful way of getting the word out is talking to your friends and family who respect your opinion and the fa that fact that you're not a stranger and you're not some radical activist, that you're just expressing your concerns to people that you know and you have some facts and you're, you're just saying, I'm concerned about this, I'm going to find out more and I think that there needs to be more of a public process is very huge. So being just polite and practical and passionate and just talking to the people that you know can have a huge impact and encouraging people to write if nothing else, to ask for those impact assessments and, and comment through, through that website because then there will be a mass influx of people, regular citizens, expressing their concerns and everybody being able to see that, not just this sliding through a back door and, and happening with no public process. I've never seen a problem with radical activism. I, I have a question. Whose decision is it? Is it Port Metro Vancouver's? Is it the federal government for going through the waters here? Who decides that it's allowed to happen on Texada? Is that Port Metro, Metro Vancouver's decision? It seems to be multi-jurisdictional. And so we need to know all the different players that we need to write to, there not just with respect to approving the project, but the provincial government, although they've been trying to avoid it, has a critical responsibility when it comes to the Texada Island end of this facility, but also, and then the health officers. So there's a lot of different actors who have a say 
here, and I believe they are all listed yeah. in the CC line um, when you submit your comments through the, the website, okay. and that would not happen if you submitted it directly. So you go the to court. the website, you write your comment to that website, and they distribute it to everybody else. Okay. Yeah, including to the port. And don't forget the SCRD, Seachelt, and Gibsons too. Oh, okay. And don't forget to look Sorry. at the back side of this uh, agenda, which has got a lot of resources. George. Yeah, I, I'd like to follow up on, on, on that last point. It's one thing to have somebody CC'd on something. It's one thing to have somebody referred, but it's another thing to kick some ass. At, well, my, my concern is that if, if you know, we send our comments through to the, I mean, let's do that for sure. Everybody in this room, everybody who knows anybody beyond that in this room should, should be doing that. But um, maybe this is a question of Nicholas. Um, given that there is provincial responsibility, particularly for, for the uh, 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 Texada end of things, it seems to me, and there's obviously federal responsibility here too in terms of the water, waterways, um, we need to be putting real pressure on, on both the provincial and the federal governments and just funneling it through, through this phony, you know, uh, kangaroo sort of process we have with, with, with a port facility that's not responsible. I'm concerned that we need to, to, to really uh, organize ourselves so that we're putting real pressure, sustained pressure on both the federal and provincial governments. So I guess if Nicholas, I'd ask um, any suggestions for us how to how to uh, count some coup there. MLA Simon, sir. Well, thank you for the question. My, my letter was to the Minister of Environment because I thought maybe she would recognize the role, but as far as I'm told by the province, it's the Ministry of Transportation, Transport Canada, and uh, that's an issue that's federal. Barges are regulated by them. Um, that there is no provincial authority other than a, par a mine amendment that doesn't need to be consulted on. And that's, that's, I know obviously there are differing opinions here, but however we can put pressure on the province, I'm welcome, I'm willing and happy to do that. That's, yeah. that's what I like. <laughs> oh. We an election in Whatcom County, and uh, four people were up for election for our county council. And it was very clear that four of the people were four the coal port there and four were against it. And what I can tell you is the community got organized. None of the people in favor of that coal port got elected, not one, okay? Yeah. So as we move forward, I tell that story every time I can because every elected official needs to hear it. And we got one here that maybe doesn't need to hear it, but all the others do need to hear it. I can assure you of that. So when you write these letters, be sure and let them know how you feel. Because if they, if they get 10 letters, it's a big deal. If they got 100 letters, they would know something was going on. And they would begin to change. I can also tell you that uh, they, they've arranged for me to speak with a lot of elected bodies, not just people. And when I get done with them, they typically are overwhelmingly against this. So you, you'll notice that every single jurisdiction in the Lower Mainland has come out against this. Now, they're listening, and, and it's not me showing up, it's the other 30 people in the room that never show up to these meetings. When there's 30 new people they've never seen, they look around and think, dang, there's something going on. So if you don't, if you don't lean on your elected officials and you don't lean on them now, that's a big mistake, I think. They need to know it. Even if they don't agree with you, even if they're the other in the political spectrum, they need to know there's a tidal wave coming at them, and that will change it. It, it, it worked in our community, I can tell you that. Laura? <laughs> okay, so I think I was just going to wrap up by suggesting four actions that everybody should take to start that tidal wave. So the first is, you've probably already all signed the Beyond Coal petition. That brings us together. Sign it online at beyondcoal.ca or sign it here. Take one home with you and get five other people to sign it. Bring it back to Jeff, send it in to us, share it on Facebook, Share it on Twitter. Share it however else you share it and other people know that you know share it. That builds our network so that it's bigger and bigger and bigger and we can start a tidal wave. So in addition to going to realporthearings.org to submit your comment to the port to say, you left us out, this is not good enough, let's start a letter writing campaign directly to that Minister of Environment, directly to the Minister of Health to, to demand a health impact assessment 
and a proper environmental assessment. The only reason that Port Metro Vancouver is doing any environmental assessment of the Fraser Surrey Dock side of this project is because we came together and demanded it. So the province may be trying to push us away now, but they're a lot more accountable to us. And if we come together and we tell them to do the right thing, eventually we'll grow big enough that they'll do it. Um, what was the final thing I was going to say? Oh, so let's start, start the letter writing campaign and get your local elected governments to do what the city of Powell River have done, has done and the Sunshine Coast Regional District has done. On your behalf, write that same letter. Ask for a health impact assessment. Ask for an, a proper environmental assessment. That includes the entire project, Texada Island, Sunshine Coast, Powell River, your waters all up and down the coast. We gotta get it done right. When there was a comment, Laura talks about it, there's an ask. You should always, when you're dealing with any bureaucrat, ask a question that requires them to get back to you. So that they're, so you're not just making a statement that goes out into the never, never land. You're, you frame your, your ending in a manner that you want them to respond to you. And as soon as they start consuming their time, uh, they, they're going to start notice. Last person completely today. Thank you. Uh, we've all got to remember that there's an election not too far down the road. But my question is this, and maybe I missed the answer earlier. In our correspondence to all these people we're going to send emails and such to, did I miss, are we going to send it to our local Indian band, to Slyaman, to Squamish Nation? I don't know if the site's set up to do that, is it? So, what I was going to say earlier is that uh, right on the site, uh, if you want to have somebody added to the list, if you want to have somebody added to the list, the distribution list, email me and say, we think, we think this person would be on the list. And I'll add them. Uh, if they eventually uh, are getting too many emails and they, uh, they block the site, that's fine. But I, we've got a list of about 10 or 12 people right now, but there should be a lot of people on that list, and we'll hit as many people as we can. It means we have to split it up in a different way so it actually you know, it doesn't bounce back. But the more people contacted, the better. And ideally, we'll get thousands and thousands of comments. And they will be bombarded. But, but that's a really important comment, which you said. First Nations are sovereign nations. And, and there, are, there, there are treaties and there are relationships that predated the formation of Canada. I mean, and in the US, they're sovereign nations. They have a right to be consulted, a legal right. All they need is enough money in their treasury to appeal the stupid rulings, and they will be found to have those rights every single time. The problem is they haven't had those resources, and they haven't had the support of all of us. So I would strongly encourage you to coordinate with your First Nation that's in, in your area. If, if you're not from here, look at the other First Nations, because they have rights that we don't have. The problem is those rights get run over regularly. When those rights are respected and enforced, when you donate the money and you raise your voice, they will have rights that can stop this and many other horrible things. Thank you. Gary, you may regret that. You'll be reading their emails till 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, thank, go ahead, please. Terrific. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, yeah, if, um, if you haven't already, if you haven't already uh, signed the information for the Alliance for Democracy and want to receive our email,